sweet, Tansy announced, gazing around enviously. Only important guests of the Seely Court are allowed here. Your father really is giving you a great honor. Tansy, please stop calling him that. I sighed, looking around the massive room. My dad was an insurance salesman from Brooklyn. I'd know if I wasn't fully human, wouldn't I? Wouldn't there be some sort of sign, pointed ears or wings or something like that? Tansy blinked, and the look she gave me sent chills up my back. Hooves clomping, she crossed the room to stand beside a large dresser with a mirror overhead. Looking back, she beckoned me with a finger. Anxiously, I moved to stand beside her. Somewhere deep inside, a voice began screaming that I didn't want to see what would be revealed next. I didn't listen in time. With a solemn look, Tansy pointed to the mirror. And for the second time that day, my world turned upside down. I hadn't seen myself since the day I stepped through the closet with Puck. I knew my clothes were filthy, sweat-stained, and ripped to shreds by branches, thorns, and claws. From the neck down, I looked how I expected to look, like a bum that had been tramping through the wilderness for two days without a bath. I didn't recognize my face. I mean, I knew it was me. The reflection moved its lips when I did, and blinked when I blinked. But my skin was paler, the bones of my face sharper, and my eyes seemed enormous, those of a deer caught in headlights, and through my matted, tangled hair, where nothing had been yesterday, two long pointed ears jutted up from both sides of my head. I gaped at the reflection, feeling dizzy, unable to comprehend the meaning. No! My brain screamed, violently rejecting the image before it. That isn't you! It isn't! The floor swayed under my feet. I couldn't catch my breath. And then... All the shock, adrenaline, fear, and horror of the past two days descended on me at once. The world spun, tilted on its axis, and I fell away into oblivion. Part Two Chapter Eleven To Tanya's Promise Megan! Mom called from the other side of the door. Get up. You're going to be late for school. I groaned and peeked out from under the covers. Was it morning already? Apparently so. A hazy gray light filtered in my bedroom window, shining on my alarm clock, which read 6.48 a.m. Megan? Mom called, and this time a sharp rapping accompanied her voice. Are you up? Yes, I hollered from the bed, wishing she'd go away. Well, hurry up, you're going to miss the bus. I shambled to my feet, threw on clothes from the cleanest pile on the floor, and grabbed my backpack. My iPod tumbled out, landing with a splat on my bed. I frowned. Why was it wet? Megan, came Mom's voice yet again, and I rolled my eyes. It's almost seven. If I have to drive you to school because you missed the bus, you're grounded for a month. All right, all right, I'm coming, damn it. Stomping down to the door, I threw it open. Ethan stood there, his face blue and wrinkled, his lips pulled into a rictus grin. In one hand, he clutched a butcher knife. Blood spattered his hands and face. Mommy slipped, he whispered and plunged the knife into my leg. I woke up, screaming. Green flames sputtered in the hearth, casting the room in an eerie glow. Panting, I lay back against cool silk pillows, the nightmare ebbing away into reality. I was in the Seely King's court, as much a prisoner here as poor Puck, trapped in his cage. Ethan, the real Ethan, was still out there somewhere waiting to be rescued. I wondered if he was all right, if he was as terrified as I was. I wondered if Mom and Luke were okay with that demon changeling in the house. I prayed Mom's injury wasn't serious and that the changeling wouldn't cause harm to anyone else. 
And then, lying in a strange bed in the fairy kingdom, another thought came to me. A thought sparked by something Oberon said. That man is not your father, Megan. I am. Is your father, not was. As if Oberon knew where he was, as if he was still alive. The thought made my heart pound in excitement. I knew it. My dad must be in fairyland, somewhere, maybe somewhere close. If only I could reach him. First things first, though, I have to get out of here. I sat up and met the impassive green eyes of the Earl King. He stood by the hearth, the shifting light of the flames washing over his face, making him even more eerie and spectral. His long shadow crept over the room, the horned crown branching over the bed covers like grasping fingers. Then the darkness, his eyes glowed green like a cat's. Seeing I was awake, he nodded and beckoned me with an elegant, long-fingered hand. Come. His voice, though soft, was steely with authority. Approach me. Let us talk, my daughter. I am not your daughter, I wanted to say, but the words stuck in my throat. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the mirror atop the dresser and my long-eared reflection within. I shuddered and turned away. Throwing off the bed covers, I saw that my clothes had been changed. Instead of the ripped, disgusting shirt and pants I'd worn for the past two days, I was clean and draped in a lacy white nightgown. Not only that, but there was an outfit laid out for me at the foot of the bed, a ridiculously fancy gown encrusted with emeralds and sapphires, as well as a cloak and long elbow-length gloves. I wrinkled my nose at the whole ensemble. Where are my clothes? I asked, turning to Oberon. My real ones. The Earl King sniffed. I dislike mortal clothes within my court, he stated quietly. I believe you should wear something suited for your heritage, as you are to stay here a while. I had your mortal rags burned. You what? Oberon narrowed his eyes, and I realized I might have gone too far. I figured the king of the Seely Court wasn't used to being questioned. Um, sorry, I murmured, sliding out of bed. I'd worry about clothes later. So, what did you want to talk about? The Earl King sighed and studied me uncomfortably. You put me in a difficult position, daughter he murmured at last, turning back to the hearth. You are the only one of my offspring to venture into our world. I must say, I was a bit surprised that you managed to survive this long, even with Robin looking after you. Offspring? I blinked. You mean, I have other brothers and sisters? Half-siblings? None that are alive? Oberon made a dismissive gesture. And none within this century, I assure you. Your mother was the only human to catch my eye in nearly two hundred years. My mouth was suddenly dry. I stared at Oberon in growing anger. Why? I demanded, making him arch a slender eyebrow. Why her? Wasn't she already married to my dad? Did you even care about that? I did not. Oberon's look was pitiless, unrepentant. What do I care for human rituals? I need no permission to take what I want. Besides, had she been truly happy, I would not have been able to sway her. Bastard. I bit my tongue to keep the angry word from coming out. Furious as I might be, I wasn't suicidal but Oberon's gaze sharpened, as if he knew what I was thinking. He gave me a long, level stare, challenging me to defy him. We glared at each other for several heartbeats, the shadows curling around us, as I struggled to keep my gaze steady. It was no use. Staring at Oberon was like facing down an approaching tornado. I shivered and dropped my eyes first. After a moment, Oberon's face softened and a faint smile curled his lips. You are a lot like her, daughter, he continued, 
his voice split between pride and resignation. Your mother was a remarkable mortal. If she had been fey, her paintings would have come to life. So much care was put into them. When I watched her at the park, I sensed her longing, her loneliness and isolation. She wanted more from her life than what she was getting, and wanted something extraordinary to happen. I didn't want to hear this. I didn't want anything ruining my perfect memory of our life before. I wanted to keep believing that my mom loved my dad, that we were happy and content, and she was his whole life. I didn't want to hear about a mother who was lonely, who fell prey to fairy tricks and glamour. With one casual statement, my past had shattered into an unfamiliar mess, and I felt I didn't know my mother at all. I waited a month before I made myself known to her. Oberon went on, oblivious to my torment. I slumped against the bed as he continued. I grew to know her habits, her emotions, every inch of her. And when I did reveal myself, I showed her only a glimpse of my true nature, curious to see if she would approach the extraordinary or if she would cling to her mortal disbelief. She accepted me, eagerly, with unrestrained joy, as if she had been waiting for me all along. Stop, I choked. My stomach churned. I closed my eyes to avoid being sick. I don't want to hear this. Where was my dad when all this was happening? Your mother's husband was away most nights. Oberon replied, putting emphasis on those two words to remind me that man was not my father. Perhaps that was why your mother yearned for something more. I gave her that. One night of magic, of the passion she was missing. Just one, before I returned to Arcadia, and the memory of us faded from her mind. She doesn't remember you? I looked up at him. Is that why she never told me? Oberon nodded. Mortals tend to forget their encounters with our kind. He said softly. At best, it seems like a vivid dream. Most times we fade from memory completely. Surely you have noticed this, how even the people you live with, who see you every day, cannot seem to remember you. Though... I always suspected your mother knew more, remembered more, than she let on, especially after you were born. A dark tone crept into his voice. His slanted eyes turned black and pupilless. I trembled as the shadow crept over the floor, reaching for me with pointed fingers. She tried to take you away, he said in a terrible voice. She wanted to hide you from us from me. Oberon paused, looking utterly inhuman, though he hadn't moved. The fire leaped in the hearth, dancing madly in the eyes of the Earl King. And yet here you are. Oberon blinked, his tone softening, and the fire flickered low again. Standing before me, your human mean faded at last, the moment you set foot in the never-never, it was only a matter of time before your heritage began to show itself. But now I must be very cautious. He drew himself up, gathering his robes around him as if to leave. I cannot be too wary, Megan Chase, he warned. There are many who would use you against me, some within this very court. Be careful, daughter. Even I cannot protect you from everything. I sagged on the bed, my thoughts spinning crazily. Oberon watched me a moment longer, his mouth set in a grim line, then crossed the room without looking back. When I looked up, the Earl King was gone. I hadn't even heard the door close. A knock on the door startled me upright. I didn't know how much time had passed since Oberon's visit. I still lay on the bed, 
The colored flames burned low, flickering erratically in the hearth. Everything seemed surreal and foggy and dreamlike, as if I'd imagined the whole encounter. The knock came again, and I roused myself. Come in. The door creaked open, and Tansy entered, smiling. Good evening, Megan Chase. How do you feel today? I slipped to the floor, realizing I was still in the nightgown. Fine, I guess, I muttered, looking around the room. Where are my clothes? King Oberon has given you a gown. Tansy smiled and pointed to the gown on the bed. He had it designed especially for you. I scowled. No, no way. I want my real clothes. The little satyr blinked. She clopped over and picked up the hem of the dress, running it between her fingers. But my lord Oberon wishes you to wear this. She seemed bewildered that I would defy Oberon's wishes. Does this not please you? Tansy, I am not wearing that. Why not? I recoiled at the thought of parading around in that circus tent. My whole life I had worn ratty jeans and t-shirts. My family was poor and couldn't afford designer clothes and name brands. Rather than bemoan the fact that I never got nice things, I flaunted my grunginess and sneered at the shallow rich girls who spent hours in the bathroom perfecting their makeup. The only dress I'd ever worn was to somebody's wedding. Besides, if I wore the fancy outfit Oberon picked for me, it would be like admitting to being his daughter, and I wasn't about to do that. I... I just don't want to, I stammered lamely. I'd rather wear my own clothes. Your clothing was burned. Where's my backpack? I suddenly remembered the change of clothes I'd shoved inside. They'd be damp, moldy, and disgusting, but better than wearing fairy finery. I found my backpack, stuffed carelessly behind the dresser, and unzipped it. A sour, dank smell rose from within as I dumped the contents onto the floor. The wadded ball of clothes rolled out, wrinkled and smelly, but mine. The broken iPod also tumbled free, skidded across the marble floor, and came to a stop a few feet from Tansy. The satyr girl yelped, and in one fantastic bound, leaped onto the bed. Clutching the bedpost, she stared wide-eyed at the device on the floor. What is that? What? This? It's an iPod. Blinking, I retrieved the device and held it up. It's a machine that plays music but it's broken now, so I can't show you how it works. Sorry. It stinks of iron. I didn't know what to say to that, so I opted for a confused frown. Tansy stared at me with huge brown eyes, very slowly coming down from her perch. You... you can hold it? She whispered. Without burning your flesh? Without poisoning your blood? Um, I glanced at the iPod, lying harmlessly in my palm. Yes? She shuddered. Please, put it away. I shrugged, grabbed my backpack, and stuffed it into a side pocket. Tansy sighed and relaxed. Forgive me, I did not wish to upset you. King Oberon has bid me keep you company until Elysium. Would you care to see more of the court? Not really, but it was better than being cooped up in here with nothing to do. And maybe I'll find a way out of this place. All right, I told the satyr girl, but I want to change first. She cast a glance at my mortal clothes, lying wrinkled on the floor, and her nostrils flared. I could tell she wanted to say something, but was polite enough not to comment on it. As you wish, I will wait outside. I slipped into the baggy jeans and the wrinkled, smelly T-shirt, feeling a nasty glow of satisfaction as they slid comfortably over my skin. Burn my things, will he? I thought, dragging my sneakers out and shoving my feet into them. I'm not part of his court, and I'm certainly not claiming to be his daughter, no matter what he says. There was a brush lying on the dresser, and I grabbed it to run through my hair. 
As I looked in the mirror, my stomach twisted. I seemed less recognizable than before, in ways that I couldn't even put a finger on. I knew only that the longer I stayed here, the more I was fading away. Shivering, I grabbed my backpack, happy for the familiar, comfortable weight, and slung it over my shoulders. Even though it carried nothing but a broken iPod, it was still mine. Refusing to glance at the mirror, feeling eyes on the back of my neck, I opened the door and slipped into the briar tunnel. Moonlight filtered through the branches, dappling the path with silver shadows. I wondered how long I'd been asleep. The night was warm and faint strings of music drifted on the breeze. Tansy approached, and in the darkness, her face looked less human and more staring black goat. A strand of moonlight fell over her, and she was normal again. Smiling, she took my hand and led me forward. The bramble tunnel seemed longer this time, filled with twists and turns I didn't remember. I looked back once and saw the thorns closing behind us, the tunnel vanishing from sight. Um, it's all right, said Tansy, pulling me forward. The hedge can take you wherever you want to go within the court. You just have to know the right paths. Where are we going? You'll see. The tunnel opened into a moonlit grove. Music drifted on the breeze, played by a willowy green girl on an elegant golden harp. A small group of elven girls clustered around a tall, vine-backed chair with white roses growing out of the arms. Sitting at the foot of the chair was a human. I blinked, rubbing my eyes to make sure they weren't playing tricks on me. No, it was a human. A young man with curly blonde hair, his eyes blank and bemused. He was shirtless, and a golden collar encircled his neck, attached to a thin silver chain. The group of fey girls swarmed around him, kissing his bare shoulders, rubbing their hands over his chest, whispering things in his ear. One of them ran a pink tongue up his neck, her fingernails drawing bloody gouges down his back, making him arch with ecstasy. My stomach turned and I looked away. A moment later, I forgot all about them. On the throne was a woman of such otherworldly beauty. I was instantly mortified by my ratty clothes and casual appearance. Her long hair shifted colors in the moonlight, sometimes silver, sometimes brightest gold. Arrogance warred with the aura of power surrounding her. As Tansy pulled me forward and bowed, the woman narrowed glittering blue eyes and regarded me as though examining a slug found beneath a log. So, she said at last, her voice dripping poisoned icicles. This is Oberon's little bastard. Oh, crap. I knew who this was. She sat the second empty throne in Oberon's court. She was the other driving force in a Midsummer Night's Dream. She was nearly as powerful as Oberon himself. Queen Titania... I gulped, bowing. It speaks, the lady went on, feigning surprise. As if it knows me, as if being Oberon's throwback will protect it from my wrath. Her eyes glittered like chips of diamond, and she smiled, making her even more beautiful and terrifying. But I am feeling merciful tonight. Perhaps I will not cut out its tongue and feed it to the hounds. Perhaps. Titania looked past me to Tansy, still bowed low, and crooked one elegant finger. Come forward, goat child. Keeping her head bowed, Tansy edged forward until she stood at the fairy queen's arm. Queen Titania leaned forward as though whispering to the satyr, but spoke loud enough for me to hear. I will allow you to be the voice for this conversation, she explained as if to a small child. I will direct all questions to you, and you will speak for the bastard over there. If, at any point, it attempts to speak to me directly, I will turn it into a heart and set my hounds after it until it collapses from exhaustion or is torn apart— 
Is this perfectly clear? Yes, my lady, Tansy whispered. Perfectly clear, bitch queen, I echoed in my thoughts. Excellent. Titania leaned back, looking pleased. She shot me a brittle smile, as hostile as a snarling dog, then turned to Tansy. Now, goat girl, why is the bastard here? Why are you here? Tansy repeated, directing the question to me. I'm looking for my brother, I replied, being careful to keep my gaze on Tansy and not the vindictive ice hag next to her. She's looking for her brother, Tansy confirmed, turning again to the fairy queen. Good God, this was going to take forever. He was stolen and brought into the Never Never, I said, plunging on before Titania could ask another question. Puck led me here through the closet. I came to get my brother and take him home, and be rid of the changeling left in his place. That's all I want. I'll leave as soon as I find him. Puck, mused the lady. Ah, that is where he has been all this time. How very clever of Oberon hiding you like that. And then you have to ruin his little deception by coming here. She tisked and shook her head. Goat girl, she said, looking at Tansy once more. Ask the bastard this. Would she prefer being a rabbit or a heart? M my lady? Tansy stammered as I felt the shadows closing in on me. My heart pounded and I looked for an escape route. Thorny briars surrounded us. There was nowhere to run. It is a simple question. Titania went on, her tone perfectly conversational. What would she prefer I change her into? A rabbit or a heart? Looking like a trapped rabbit herself, Tansy turned and met my eyes. M my lady would like to know if you... Yes, I heard, I interrupted. A rabbit or a heart? How about neither... I dared look up and meet the fairy queen's eyes. Look, I know you hate me, but just let me rescue my brother and go home. He's only four, and he must be terrified. Please, I know he's waiting for me. Once I find him, we'll leave and you'll never see us again, I swear. Titania's face glowed with angry triumph. The creature dares to speak to me? Very well. She has chosen her fate. The fairy queen raised a gloved hand, and lightning flashed overhead. A heart it is, then. Set free the hounds. We will have a merry hunt. Her hand swept down, pointing at me, and spasms rocked my body. I screamed and arched my back, feeling my spine lengthen and pop. Invisible pliers grabbed my face and pulled, stretching my lips into a muzzle. I felt my legs getting longer, thinner, my fingers turning into cloven hooves. I screamed again, but what left my throat was the agonized bleat of a deer. Then, suddenly, it stopped. My body snapped into the proper shape, like a taut rubber band, and I collapsed, gasping to the forest floor. Through my blurry vision, I saw Oberon standing at the mouth of the tunnel, a pair of fairy knights behind him, his arms outstretched. For a moment, I was sure I saw Grimalkin standing by his feet, but I blinked and the shadows were empty. With his appearance, the lilting harp music ground to a halt. The fey girls surrounding the collared human flung themselves to the floor and bowed their heads. Wife, Oberon said calmly, stepping into the clearing. You will not do this. Titania rose, her face a mask of fury. You dare speak to me that way, she spat, and wind rattled the branches of the trees. You dare, after you hid her from me, after you sent your little pet to protect her. Titania sneered, and lightning crackled overhead. You deny me a consort, and yet you flaunt your half-breed abomination in the court for all to see. You are a disgrace, 
The court mocks you in secret, and you still protect her. Nonetheless. Somehow, Oberon's composed voice rose above the howling wind. She is my blood, and you will not touch her. If you have any grievances, my lady, cast them on me, not the girl. It is not her fault. Perhaps I should turn her into a cabbage, the queen mused, shooting me a look of black hatred, and plant her in my garden for the rabbits to enjoy. Then she would be useful and wanted. You will not touch her. Oberon said again, his voice rising in authority. His cloak billowed out, and he grew taller, his shadow lengthening on the ground. I command it, wife. I have given my word that she shall not come to harm within my court, and you will follow me on this. Do I make myself clear? Lightning sizzled, and the ground shook under the intensity of the ruler's gazes. The girls at the foot of the throne cringed, and Oberon's guards grasped the hilts of their swords. A branch snapped nearby, barely missing the harp girl, who cowered under the trunk. I pressed myself to the earth and tried to make myself as small as possible. Very well, husband. Titania's voice was as cold as ice, but the wind gradually died and the earth stopped moving. As you command... I will not harm the half-breed while she is within the court. Oberon gave a curt nod. And your servants will not do her ill either. The queen pursed her lips as if she'd swallowed a lemon. No, husband. The Earl King sighed. Very well. We will speak on this later. I bid you good night, my lady. He turned, his cloak billowing behind him, and left the clearing, the guards trailing in his wake. I wanted to call after him, but I didn't want it to look like I was running after Daddy's protection, especially after he put the smackdown onto Tanya. Speaking of which, I swallowed and turned to face the fairy queen, who glared at me as if hoping the blood would boil in my veins. Well, you heard his majesty half-breed. She cooed, her voice laced with poison. Get out of my sight before I forget my promise and change you into a snail. I was only too happy to leave. However, no sooner did I stand up and prepare to flee than Titania snapped her fingers. Wait, she ordered. I have a better idea. Goat girl, come here. Tansy appeared at her side. The satyr looked terrified. Her eyes were bulging out of her head, and her furry legs trembled. The queen flicked a finger at me. Take Oberon's bastard to the kitchens. Tell Sarah we found her a new serving girl. If the bastard must stay, she might as well work. But, my lady, Tansy stammered, and I marveled that she had the courage to contradict the queen. King Oberon said, Ah, but King Oberon is no longer here, is he? Titania's eyes gleamed, and she smiled. And what Oberon does not know will not hurt him. Now go, before I truly lose my patience. We went, trying not to trip over each other as we fled the queen's presence and went back into the tunnel, as we reached the edge of the brambles, a ripple of power shook the air, and the girls behind us gave cries of dismay. A moment later, a fox darted into the tunnel with a flash of red fur. It stopped a few yards away and looked at us, amber eyes wide with confusion and fear. I saw the gleam of a golden collar around its throat before it gave a frightened bark and vanished into the thorns. In silence... I followed Tansy through the twisting maze of briars, trying to process all that had happened. Okay, so Titania had a serious grudge against me. That was really, really bad. 
As the record of enemies I did not want went, the Queen of the Fairies would probably top the list. I would have to be really careful from now on, or risk ending up a mushroom in somebody's soup. Tansy didn't say a word until we came to a pair of large stone doors in the hedge. Tendrils of steam curled out beneath the cracks, and the air was hot and greasy. Pushing the doors open released a blast of hot, smoky air. Blinking tears from my eyes, I stared into the enormous kitchen. Brick ovens roared, copper kettles bubbled over fires, and a dozen aromas filled my senses. Furry little men in aprons scuttled back and forth between several long counters, cooking, baking, testing the contents of the kettles. A bloody boar carcass lay on a table, and hacking into it was a huge, green-skinned woman with thick tusks and brown hair pulled into a braid. She saw us in the doorway and came stomping over, blood and bits of meat clinging to her apron. No loafers in my kitchen, she growled, waving a large bronze butcher knife at me. I got no scraps for the likes of you. Take your sneaky thieving fingers elsewhere. Sarah Skinflayer, this is Megan Chase. As Tansy introduced us, I gave the troll woman a sickly, please-don't-kill-me smile. She's to help you in the kitchen by order of the queen. I don't need help from a skinny half-human whelp, Sarah Skinflayer growled, eyeing me disdainfully. She'd only slow us down, and we're running ourselves into the ground getting ready for Elysium. Looking me over, she sighed and scratched her head with the blunt end of the knife. I guess I could find a place for her. But tell Her Majesty that if she wants to torture someone else, try the stables or the kennel runs. I've got all the help I need here. Tansy nodded and left quickly, leaving me alone with the giantess. I felt sweat dripping down my back, and it wasn't from the fires. All right, whelp. Sarah Skinflayer barked, pointing at me with her knife. I don't care if you are His Majesty's throwback. You're in my kitchen now. Rules here are simple. You don't work, you don't eat. And I have a little fun with the horsewhip in the corner. They don't call me Sarah Skinflayer for nothing. The rest of the night passed in a blur of scrubbing and cleaning, I mopped blood and bits of flesh from the stone floor. I swept ashes from the brick ovens. I washed mountains of plates, goblets, pots, and pans. Every time I paused to rub my aching limbs, the troll woman would be there, barking orders and pushing me to my next chore. Toward the end of the night, after catching me sitting on a stool, she growled something about lazy humans, snatched the broom from my hands, and gave me the one she was carrying. As soon as my hands closed around the handle, the broom leapt to life and began sweeping vigorously, brisk, hard strokes, while my feet carried me around the room. I tried letting go of the thing, but my fingers seemed glued to the handle, and I couldn't open my hands. I swept the floor until my legs ached and my arms burned, until I couldn't see for the sweat in my eyes. Finally, the troll woman snapped her fingers and the broom stopped its mad sweeping. I collapsed, my knees buckling underneath me, tempted to hurl the sadistic broom into the nearest oven. Did you enjoy that, half-breed? Sarah Skinflayer asked, and I was too winded to answer. There will be more of the same tomorrow. I guarantee it. Here. Two pieces of bread and a lump of cheese hit the ground. That's the dinner you earn tonight. It should be safe for you to eat. Maybe tomorrow you'll get something better. Fine, I muttered, ready to crawl back to my room, thinking there was no way I was ever coming back here. I plan to conveniently forget about my forced servitude tomorrow. Maybe even find a way out of the Sealy Court. See you tomorrow. The troll blocked my path. Where do you think you're going, half-breed? You're part of my workforce now, so that means you're mine.
She pointed to a wooden door in the corner. The servants' quarters are full. You can take the pantry closet there. She smiled at me, fierce and terrible, showing blunt yellow teeth and tusks. We start work at dawn. See you tomorrow, whelp. I ate my measly dinner and crawled beneath shelves of onions, turnips, and strange blue vegetables to sleep. I had no blanket, but the kitchens were uncomfortably warm. I was trying to turn a sack of grain into a pillow when I remembered my backpack, tossed onto a shelf, and crawled out to retrieve it. There was nothing in the orange pack now but a broken iPod, but still, it was mine, the only reminder of my old life. I snatched the backpack off the shelf and was walking back toward my tiny room when I felt something wriggle inside the pack. Startled, I nearly dropped it and heard a soft snicker coming from inside. Edging over to the counter, I put the bag down, grabbed a knife, and unzipped it, ready to plunge the blade into whatever jumped out. My iPod lay there, dead and silent. With a sigh, I zipped the pack up and carried it to the pantry with me. Tossing it into a corner, I curled up on the floor, put my head on the bag of grain, and let my thoughts drift. I thought of Ethan, and Mom, and school. Was anyone missing me back home? Were there such parties being sent out for me, police and dogs sniffing around the last places I was seen? Or had Mom forgotten me, as I was sure Luke had? Would I even have a home to go back to, if I did manage to find Ethan? I started to shake, and my eyes grew misty. Soon... Tears flowed down my cheeks, staining the sack under my head and making my hair sticky. I turned my face into the rough fabric and sobbed. I'd hit rock bottom, lying in a dark pantry with no hope of rescuing Ethan and nothing to look forward to but fear, pain, and exhaustion. I was ready to give up. Gradually, as my sobs stilled and my breathing grew calmer, I realized I was not alone. Raising my head, I first saw my backpack, where I'd flung it in the corner. It was unzipped, lying open like a gaping maw. I saw the glint of the iPod inside. Then, I saw the eyes. My heart stopped, and I sat up quickly, banging my head against the shelf. Dust showered me as I scooted to the far corner, gasping. I'd seen those eyes before glowing green and intelligent. The creature was small, smaller than the goblins, with oily black skin and long, spindly arms. Except for the large, goblin-like ears, it looked like a horrible cross between a monkey and a spider. The creature smiled, and its teeth lit the corner with pale blue light. Then it spoke. Its voice echoed flatly in the gloom, like a radio speaker hissing static. I couldn't understand it at first. Then, as if it were changing the station, the static cleared away and I heard words. Are waiting, it crackled, its voice still buzzing with static. Come to, Iron, your brother, held in. Ethan? I bolted upright, banging my head again. Where is he? What do you know about him? Iron Court. We waiting for. The creature flickered in the darkness, going fuzzy like a weak signal. It hissed and blipped out of sight, plunging the room into blackness again. I lay there in the gloom, my heart pounding, thinking about what the creature had said. I couldn't glean much from the eerie conversation, except that my brother was alive and something called the Iron Court was waiting for something. All right, I told myself, taking a deep breath. They're still out there, Megan. Ethan and your dad. You can't give up now. Time to stop being a crybaby and get your act together. I snatched the iPod and stuffed it into my back pocket. If that monster thing came to me with any more news of Ethan, I wanted to be ready. Lying back on the cold floor, I closed my eyes and started to plan.
The next two days passed in a blur. I did everything the troll woman told me to do. Washed dishes, scrubbed floors, sliced meat off animal carcasses until my hands were stained red. No more spells were cast on me, and Sarah's skin flare began to eye me with grudging respect. The food they offered was simple fare, bread and cheese and water. The troll woman informed me anything more exotic might wreak havoc with my delicate half-human system. At night, I would crawl, exhausted, into my bed in the pantry and fall asleep immediately. The spindly creature visited me no more after that first night, and my sleep was blissfully free of nightmares. All the while, I kept my eyes and ears open, gleaning information that would help me when I finally made my escape. In the kitchen, under the hawk eye of Sarah's skin flare, escape was impossible. The troll woman had a habit of appearing whenever I thought about taking a break, or striding into a room just as I finished a task. I did try to sneak out of the kitchen one night, but when I pulled open the front door, a small storage room greeted me instead of the tunnel of thorns. I almost despaired at that point, but I forced myself to be patient. The time would come, I told myself. I would just have to be ready when it did. I spoke with the other kitchen workers when I could, creatures called brownies and house gnomes, but they were so busy I gained little information from them. I did discover something that made my heart pound excitedly. Elysium, the event that had everyone in the kitchen running around like mad things, would be held in a few days. As tradition dictated, the Sealy and unseelie courts would meet on neutral ground to discuss politics, sign new accords, and maintain their very uneasy truce. Since it was spring, the unseelie court would be traveling to Oberon's territory for Elysium. In winter, the unseelie would play host. Everyone in the court was invited, and, as kitchen staff, we were required to be there. I continued working hard, my own plans for Elysium running around in my head— then, three days after my sentence to the kitchens, we had visitors. I was standing over a basket of tiny dead quail, plucking them after Sarah's skin flayer broke their necks and passed them to me. I tried to ignore the troll as she reached into the cage, grabbed a flapping, bright-eyed bird, and twisted its neck with a faint popping sound. She then tossed the lifeless body into the basket like a plucked fruit and reached for another. The door swung open abruptly, streaming light into the room, and three fairy knights walked in. Long silver hair pulled into simple ponytails glimmered in the dimness of the room, and their faces were haughty and arrogant. We have come for the half-breed, one of them announced, his voice ringing through the kitchen. By order of King Oberon, she will come with us. Sarah Skinflayer glanced my way snorted, and picked up another quail. That's fine with me. The brat's been nothing but dead weight since she came here. Take her out of my kitchens, and good riddance to her. She punctured the statement with a sharp crack of the bird's neck, and a brownie left the oven to take my place, shooing me away as it hopped onto a stool. I started to follow them, but remembered my backpack lying on the floor of the pantry closet— Muttering an apology, I hurried to grab it, slinging it over my back as I returned. None of the brownies looked up at me as I left, though Sarah's skin flare glowered as she wrung a bird's neck. Battling relief and an odd sense of guilt, I followed the knights out of the room. They led me through the twisting brambles to yet another door, opening it without preamble. I walked into a small bedroom, not nearly as fancy as my first, but nice enough. I glimpsed a round, steaming pool through a side room door and thought longingly of a bath. I heard muffled clops on the carpeted floor and turned to see a pair of satyr girls enter behind a tall, willowy woman with pure white skin and straight raven hair. She wore a dress so black it sucked in the light, and her fingers were long and spider-like. One of the satyr girls peeked at me from behind the woman's dress. I recognized Tansy who gave me a timid smile, as if she feared I was mad about the encounter with Titania. I wasn't. She had been a pawn in the fairy queen's game, just like me.
but before I could say anything, the tall woman swept up and grabbed me, holding my chin in her bony fingers, black eyes with no iris or pupil, scanned my face. Filthy, she rasped, her voice like silk over steel blade. What a plain, dirty little specimen. What does Oberon expect me to do with this? I'm not a miracle worker. I wrenched my face from her grasp, and the satyr girl squeaked. The lady, however, seemed amused. <laughs> well, I suppose we shall have to try. Halfbreed? My name is not Halfbreed, I snapped, tired of hearing the word. It's Megan. Megan Chase. The woman didn't blink. You give out your full name so easily, child, she stated, making me frown in confusion. You are lucky that is not your true name, else you might find yourself in a dire situation. Very well, Megan Chase. I am Lady Weaver, and you will listen to me carefully. King Oberon has asked me to make you presentable for Elysium tonight. He will not have his half-breed daughter parading around in peasant rags, or worse, mortal clothes, in front of the unseely court. I told him I would do my best and not to expect miracles, but we shall try. Now, she gestured to the side room. First things first, you reek of human, troll, and blood. Go take a bath. She clapped once, and two satyrs trotted around to face me. Tansy and Clarissa will attend you. Now, I must design something for you to wear that will not make a laughing stock of your father. I glanced at Tansy, who wasn't meeting my eyes. Silently, I followed them to the pool, stripped off my disgusting clothes, and sank into the hot water. Bliss. I floated for several minutes, letting the heat soak into my bones, easing the aches and pains from the past three days. I wondered if fairies ever got dirty or sweaty. I'd never seen any of the nobles look anything less than elegant. The heat was making me sleepy. I must have dozed, for I had disturbing dreams of spiders crawling over my body in great black swarms, covering me with webs as if I were a giant fly. When I awoke, shuddering and itchy, I was lying on the bed, and Lady Weaver stood over me. Well, she sighed as I struggled to my feet. It's not my greatest work, but I suppose it will have to do. Come here, girl. Stand before the mirror a moment. I did as she asked, and gaped at the reflection it showed me. A shimmering silver dress covered me, the material lighter than silk. It rippled like water with the slightest movement, lacy sleeves billowing out from my arms, barely touching my skin. My hair had been elegantly curled and twisted into a graceful swirl atop my head, held in place by sparkling pins. A sapphire the size of a baby's fist flashed blue fire at my throat. Well... Lady Weaver gently touched one of my sleeves, admiring it like an artist would a favorite painting. What do you think? It's beautiful, I managed to say, staring at the elven princess in the glass. I don't even recognize myself. An image flashed through my head, and I giggled with slight hysteria. I won't turn into a pumpkin when midnight comes, will I? If you annoy the wrong people, you might. Lady Weaver turned away, clapping her hands. Like clockwork, Tansy and Clarissa appeared wearing simple white dresses, their curly hair brushed out. I caught a glimpse of horns beneath Tansy's hazel bangs. She held my orange backpack in two fingers, as if afraid it would bite her. I had the girls wash your mortal clothes. Lady Weaver said, turning away from the mirror. Oberon would have them destroyed, but then that would mean more work for me, so I put them in your bag. Once Elysium is over, I'll be taking that dress back, so you'll want to hang on to your own clothes. Um, okay, 
I said, taking the backpack from Tansy. A quick inspection showed my jeans and shirt folded inside and the iPod still hidden in a side pocket. For a moment, I thought to leave the pack behind, but decided against it. Oberon might find it offensive and have someone burn it without my knowledge. It was still mine and held everything I owned in this world. Feeling slightly embarrassed, I swung it over one shoulder, the hillbilly princess with a bright orange pack. Let us go, Lady Weaver rasped, wrapping a gauzy black shawl around her throat. Elysium awaits. And half-breed, I worked hard on that dress. Do try not to get yourself killed. Chapter 12 Elysium We walked through the briar tunnels into the courtyard. As before, it was packed with fey, but the mood had changed into something dark. Music played, haunting and feral, and fairies danced, leaped, and cavorted in wild abandon. A satyr knelt behind an unresting girl with red skin, running his hands up her ribs and kissing her neck. Two women with fox ears circled a dazed-looking brownie, their golden eyes bright with hunger. A group of fey nobles danced in hypnotic patterns, their movements erotic, sensual, lost in music and passion. I felt the wild urge to join them, to throw back my head and spin into the music, not caring where it took me. I closed my eyes for a moment, feeling the lilting strains lift my soul and make it soar toward the heavens. My throat tightened, and my body began to sway in tune with the music. I opened my eyes with a start. Without meaning to, I'd begun walking toward the circle of dancers. I bit my lip, hard, tasting blood and the sharp pain brought me back to my senses. Get it together, Megan. You can't let down your guard. That means no eating, dancing, or talking to strangers. Focus on what you have to do. I saw Oberon and Titania sitting at a long table, surrounded by sealy knights and trolls. The king and queen sat side by side, but were actively ignoring each other. Oberon's chin rested on his hands as he gazed out over his court. Titania sat like she had an icy pole shoved up her backside. Puck was nowhere to be seen. I wondered if Oberon had freed him yet. Enjoying the festivities? Asked a familiar voice. Grimalkin! I cried, spotting the gray cat perched on the edge of a raised stool, tail curled around his legs. His golden eyes regarded me with the same lazy disinterest. What are you doing here? He yawned. I was taking a nap, but it appears things might get interesting soon, so I think I will stick around. Rising, the cat stretched, arching his back, and gave me a sideways look. So, human, how is life in Oberon's court? You knew, I accused him as he sat down and licked a paw. You knew who I was all along. That's why you agreed to take me to Puck. You were hoping to blackmail Oberon. Blackmail, said Grimalkin, blinking languid yellow eyes, is a barbaric word. And you have much to learn about the Fae, Megan Chase. You think others would not have done the same? Everything here has a price. Ask Oberon. For that matter, ask your Puck. I wanted to ask what he meant, but at that moment a shadow fell over my back, and I turned to see Lady Weaver looming over me. The winter court will arrive soon, she rasped, pencil-thin fingers closing on my shoulder. You must take your place at the table. Beside King Oberon, he has requested your presence. Go, go. Her grip tightened, and she steered me to the table where Oberon and the lords of the summer court waited. Oberon's gaze was carefully neutral, but Titania's glare of utter hatred made me want to run and hide. Between Scary Spider Lady and the Queen of the Seely Court, I was pretty sure I would end the night as a mouse or a cockroach. Pay your respects to your father. Lady Weaver hissed in my ear, before giving me a small push toward the Earl King. 
I swallowed, and under dark gazes of the nobles approached the table. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I felt like I was giving a speech before the school auditorium and had forgotten my notes. Pleading silently for a cue, I met Oberon's empty green eyes and dropped into a clumsy curtsy. The Earl King shifted in his seat. I saw his eyes flicker to the bright orange backpack and narrow slightly. My cheeks flamed, but I couldn't take it off now. The court welcomes Megan Chase, Oberon said in a stiff, formal voice. He paused, as if waiting for me to say something, but my voice caught in my throat. Silence stretched between us, and someone in the crowd snickered. Finally, Oberon gestured toward an empty chair near the end of the table, and I sat, red and blushing under the eyes of the entire court. That was impressive, mused a voice near my feet. Grimalkin leaped into the chair beside me, just as I was about to put my backpack where he stood. You definitely inherited your father's rapier wit. Lady Weaver must be so proud. Shut up, Grim. I muttered, and shoved the pack under my seat. I would have said more, but at that moment, the music stopped, and a loud trumpeting began. They've arrived, Grimalkin stated, eyes narrowing to golden slits. The cat almost seemed to smile. This should be very interesting. The trumpeting grew louder, and at one end of the court, the ever-present wall of thorns shifted curled back, and formed a grand archway, much taller and more elegant than I'd seen before. Black roses burst into bloom among the thorns, and an icy wind hissed through the gate, coating nearby trees with frost. A creature padded through the arch, and I shuddered from more than the cold. It was a goblin, green and warty, dressed in a fancy black coat with gold buttons. It cast a sly look around the waiting court, puffed out its chest, and cried in a clear yet gravelly voice, Her Majesty Queen Mab, Lady of the Winter Court, Sovereign of the Autumn Territories, and Queen of Air and Darkness. And the unseely came. At first glance, they looked very similar to the Seely Fay. The little men carrying the unseely banner looked like gnomes in fancy cloaks and red caps. Then I noticed their jagged, shark-like grins and the bright madness in their eyes, and knew these were not friendly garden gnomes, not in any sense of the word. Red caps, Grimalkin mused, wrinkling his nose. You will want to stay away from them, human. Last time they came, a not-too-bright puka challenged one to a rigged shell game and won. It did not go well. What happened? I asked, wondering what a puka was. They ate him. He pointed out the ogres next, great hulking beasts with thick, stupid faces and tusks slick with drool. Manacles bound their wrists, and silver chains were wrapped about their huge necks. They shambled into the court like drugged gorillas, knuckles dragging on the ground, oblivious to the murderous glares they were receiving from the trolls. More unseely spilled into the clearing, thin, skulking bogies like the one in Ethan's closet, creeping along the ground like spindly spiders, snarling, hissing goblins, a man with the head and chest of a shaggy black goat, his horns sweeping into wicked points that caught the light. And more creatures, each one more nightmarish than the first. They leered when they caught sight of me, licking their lips and teeth. Thankfully, under the stern glares of Oberon and Titania, none of them approached the table. Finally, as the court swelled to nearly twice its number, Queen Mab made her appearance. The first hint I received was that the temperature in the clearing dropped about ten degrees. Goosebumps rose along my arms, and I shivered, wishing I had something heavier than a dress made of spider silk and gauze. I was about to move my chair a few feet down the table, out of the wind, when a cloud of snow burst from the mouth of the tunnel, and in walked the kind of woman that made ladies weep in envy 
and men launch wars. She wasn't tall like Oberon or willowy thin like Titania, but her presence drew every eye in the courtyard. Her hair was so black it appeared blue in places, and it spilled down her back like a waterfall of ink. Her eyes were of the void, of a night without stars, a sharp contrast to her marble skin and pale mulberry lips. She wore a dress that writhed around her like shadow incarnate, and, like Oberon and Titania, she radiated power. The amount of fay in the courtyard, both seely and unseely, was making me very, very nervous. But just as I thought things couldn't get any eerier, Mab's entourage walked in. The first two were tall and beautiful like the rest of their kind, all sharp angles and graceful limbs. They wore their black and silver suits with the easy confidence of nobles, raven hair pulled back to highlight their proud, cruel features. Like dark princes, they marched behind Mab with all the arrogance of the queen. Thin hands resting on their swords, their capes flapping behind them. The third noble, walking behind them, was also dressed in black and silver. Like the other two, he carried a sword, resting comfortably on his hip, and his face bore the fine lines of an aristocrat. But, unlike the others, he looked disinterested almost bored with the entire event. His eyes caught the moonlight and glittered like silver coins. My heart turned to ice, and my stomach threatened to crawl up my throat. It was him, the boy from my dreams, the one who had chased Puck and me through the forest. I glanced around wildly, wondering if I could hide before he saw me. Grimalkin gave me a bemused stare and twitched his tail. It's him, I whispered, cutting my gaze to the nobles approaching behind the queen. That boy, he was hunting me that day in the forest when I landed in your tree. He tried to kill me. Grimalkin blinked. That is Prince Ash, youngest son of Queen Mab. They say he is quite the hunter and spends much of his time in the Wildwood, instead of at court with his brothers. I don't care who he is. I hissed, ducking down in my seat. I can't let him see me. How do I get out of here? Grimalkin's snort sounded suspiciously like laughter. I wouldn't worry about that, human. Ash would not risk Oberon's fury by attacking you in his own court. The rules of Elysium prevent violence of any kind. Besides, the cat sniffed. That hunt was days ago. It is likely he has forgotten all about you. I scowled at Grimalkin and kept the fey boy in my sights as he bowed to Oberon and Titania, murmuring something I couldn't hear. Oberon nodded, and the prince stepped back, still bowing. When he straightened and turned around, his gaze swept over the table. To rest solely on me. His eyes narrowed, and he smiled, giving me a small nod. My heart sped up, and I shivered. Ash hadn't forgotten me, not by a long shot. As the night wore on, I thought longingly of my days in the kitchens. Not just because Prince Ash, though he was the main reason I tried to avoid notice. The minions of the unseely court made me jumpy and uncomfortable, and I wasn't the only one. Tension ran high among the ranks of Seely and Unseely. It was plain that these were ancient enemies. Only the Fey's devotion to rules and proper etiquette, and the power of their she-masters, kept things from erupting into a bloodbath. Or so Grimalkin told me. I took his word for it and remained very still in my seat, trying not to attract attention. Oberon, Titania, and Mab stayed at the table all night. The three princes sat to Mab's left, with Ash farthest down the table, much to my relief. Food was served, wine was poured, and the she rulers spoke among themselves. Grimalkin yawned, bored with it all, and left my side, vanishing into the crowds. After what seemed like hours, the entertainment began. Three brightly dressed boys with monkey tails swung onto the stage set before the table, 
They performed amazing leaps and tumbles over, onto, and through one another. A satyr played his pipes, and a human danced to the tune until her feet bled, her face a mixture of terror and ecstasy. A stunning woman with goat hooves and piranha teeth sang a ballad about a man who followed his lover beneath the waters of the lake, never to be seen again. At the end of the song, I gasped air into my burning lungs and sat up, unaware that I'd been unable to breathe. Sometimes, during the course of the festivities, Ash disappeared. Frowning, I scanned the courtyard for him, searching for a pale face and dark hair among the chaotic sea of Fay. He wasn't in the courtyard, as far as I could see, and he wasn't at the table with Mab and Oberon. There was a soft chuckle beside me, and my heart stopped. So, this is Oberon's famous half-blood, Ash mused as I whirled around. His eyes, cold and inhuman, glimmered with amusement. Up close, he was even more beautiful, with high cheekbones and dark tousled hair falling into his eyes. My traitor hands itched, longing to run my fingers through those bangs. Horrified, I clenched them in my lap, trying to concentrate on what Ash was saying. And to think, the prince continued, smiling. I lost you that day in the forest and didn't even know what I was chasing. I shrank back, eyeing Oberon and Queen Mab. They were deep in conversation and did not notice me. I didn't want to interrupt them simply because a prince of the unseely court was talking to me. Besides, I was a fairy princess now, even if I didn't quite believe it. Ash certainly did. I took a deep breath, raised my chin, and looked him straight in the eye. I warn you, I said, pleased that my voice didn't tremble, that if you try anything, my father will remove your head and stick it to a plaque on his wall. He shrugged one lean shoulder. There are worse things. At my horrified look, he offered a faint, self-derogatory smile. Don't worry, princess. I won't break the rules of Elysium. I have no intention of facing Mab's wrath, should I embarrass her. That's not why I'm here. Then what do you want? He bowed. A dance. What? I stared at him in disbelief. You tried to kill me. Technically, I was trying to kill Puck. You just happened to be there. But yes, if I'd had the shot, I would have taken it. Then why the hell would you think I'd dance with you? That was then. He regarded me blandly. This is now. And it's tradition in Elysium that a son and daughter of opposite territories dance with each other to demonstrate the goodwill between the courts. Well, it's a stupid tradition. I crossed my arms and glared. And you can forget it. I'm not going anywhere with you. He raised an eyebrow. Would you insult my monarch, Queen Mab, by refusing? She would take it very personally and blame Oberon for the offense. And Mab can hold a grudge for a very, very long time. Oh, damn. I was stuck. If I said no, I would insult the fairy queen of the unseely court. I'd also be on the shit lists of both Mab and Titania, and between them, my chances of survival were easily and completely nil. So, you're saying you're not giving me a choice? There is always a choice. Ash held out his hand. I will not force you. I only follow the orders of my queen. But know that the rest of the court is expecting us. He smiled then, bitter and self-mocking. And I promise to be a perfect gentleman until the night is done. You have my word. Damn it. I hugged my arms, trying to think of something to get me out of this. I'll just embarrass you anyway, I told him defiantly. I can't dance. You're Oberon's blood. A cool note of amusement colored his voice. Of course you can dance. I struggled with myself a moment longer. This is the prince of the unseely court, I thought, my mind racing. Maybe he'll know something about Ethan 
or your dad. The least you can do is ask. I took a deep breath. Ash waited patiently with his hand outstretched, and when I finally put my fingers into his palm, he offered a faint smile. His skin was cold as he smoothly moved my hand to his arm, and I shivered at the nearness of him. He smelled sharply of frost and something alien, not unpleasant, but strange. We left the table together, and my stomach twisted as I saw hundreds of glowing fey eyes watching us. Sealy and unsealy alike parted for us, bowing as we approached the open stage. My knees trembled. I can't do this, I whispered, clutching Ash's arm for support. Let me go. I think I'm going to be sick. You'll be fine. Ash didn't look at me as we stepped onto the dance floor. He faced the trio of fey rulers with his head up and his expression blank. I looked over the sea of faces and shook in terror. Ash tightened his grip on my hand. Just follow my lead. He bowed to Oberon's table, and I curtsied. The Earl King gave a solemn nod, and Ash turned to face me, taking one of my hands and guiding the other to his shoulder. The music started. Ash stepped forward, and I almost tripped, biting my lip as I tried to match his steps. We more or less minced around the stage, me concentrating on not falling or stepping on toes, Ash moving with tiger-like grace. Thankfully, no one booed or threw things, but I stumbled forward and back in a daze, only wanting the humiliation to end. Somewhere in this waking nightmare, I heard a chuckle. Stop thinking, Ash muttered, pulling me into a spin that ended with me against his chest. The audience doesn't matter. The steps don't matter. Just close your eyes and listen to the music. Easy for you to say, I growled, but he spun me again so quickly that the stage whirled and I closed my eyes. Remember why you're doing this, my mind hissed. This is for Ethan. Right. I opened my eyes and faced the dark prince. So, I muttered, trying to sound conversational. You're Queen Mab's son, right? I think we've established that, yes. Does she like to... collect things? Ash looked at me strangely, and I hurried on. Humans, I mean. Does she have a lot of humans in her court? A few. Ash spun me again, and this time I went with it. His eyes were bright as I came back to his arms. Mab usually gets bored with mortals after a few years. She either releases them or turns them into something more interesting, depending on her mood. Why? My heart pounded. Does she have a little boy in her court? I asked as we swirled around the stage. Four years old, curly brown hair, blue eyes? Quiet most of the time? Ash regarded me strangely. I don't know, he said to my disappointment. I haven't been to court lately. Even if I had, I cannot keep track of all the mortals the queen acquires and releases over the years. Oh, I muttered, lowering my eyes. Well, that idea was shot. Well, if you're not in court, where are you then? Ash gave me a chilling smile. The Wildwood, he replied, spinning me away. Hunting. I rarely let my prey escape, so be grateful Puck is such a coward. Before I could answer, he pulled me close again, his mouth against my ear. Although, I am happy I didn't kill you then. I told you a daughter of Oberon could dance. I'd forgotten about the music, and realized my body was acting on autopilot, sweeping over the dance floor as if I'd done it a thousand times. For a long moment we said nothing, lost in the music and the dance. My emotions soared as the crescendo rose into the night, and there was no one except us, spinning around and around. The music ceased as Ash pulled me into a final spin. I ended up pressed against him his face inches from mine, his gray eyes bright and intense. We stood there a moment, frozen in time, our hearts thrumming wildly between us. The rest of the world had disappeared. 
Ash blinked and offered a tiny smile. It would take only a half step to meet his lips. A scream shattered the night, jerking us back to our senses. The prince released me and stepped away, his face shutting into that blank mask once more. The scream came again, followed by a thunderous roar that rattled the tables and sent fine crystal goblets crashing to the floor. Over the crowd of spectators, I saw the bramble wall shaking wildly as something large tore its way through. Fay began shouting and pushing one another, and Oberon stood, his ringing voice calling for order. For just a moment, everyone froze. The brambles parted with deafening snaps, and something huge clawed its way free. Blood streaked the tawny hide of a monster, not a shadowy under-your-bed bogey that jumped out at you, but a real monster that would rip open your stomach and eat your entrails. It had three horrible heads, a lion with a bloody satyr in its jaws, a goat with mad white eyes, and a hissing dragon with molten flame dripping from its teeth. A chimera. For a heartbeat, it paused, staring at the party it had just interrupted, the heads blinking in unison. The dead satyr, now a chewed, mangled mess, dropped to the ground, and someone in the crowd screamed. The chimera roared, three voices rising to a deafening shriek. The crowd scattered as the monster gathered its hindquarters under it and leapt into the fray. It came down beside a fleeing red cap and lashed out with a claw-tipped paw, catching the fairy in the stomach and disemboweling it instantly. As the red cap staggered and fell, holding its intestines, the chimera turned and pounced on a troll, bearing it to the ground. The troll snarled and grabbed the lion's throat, holding it away. But then the dragon head came down, clamping its jaws around the troll's neck and twisting. Dark blood exploded in a fine spray, filling the air with a sickening, coppery smell. The troll shuddered and went limp. Gore dripping from its snout, the chimera looked up and saw me, still frozen on the stage. With a roar, it sprang, landing on the edge of the dance floor. My brain screamed at me to run, but I couldn't move. I could only stare in detached fascination as it crouched, muscles rippling under its bloody fur. Its hot breath washed over me, stinking of blood and rotten meat, and I saw a scrap of red clothing on the lion's tooth. With a shriek, the chimera pounced, and I closed my eyes, hoping it'd be quick. Chapter 13 Escape from the Seely Court Something slammed into me, pushing me away. Pain shot up my arm as I landed on my shoulder, and I opened my eyes with a gasp. Ash stood between me and the chimera, his sword unsheathed. The blade glowed an icy blue, wreathed in frost and mist. The monster roared and swatted at him, but he leapt aside, slashing with his blade. The frozen edge bit into the chimera's paw, drawing a human-like scream from the monster. It pounced, and Ash rolled away. On his feet again, he raised an arm, bluish light sparkling from his fingers. As the monster whirled on him, he flung his hand out, and the chimera shrieked as a flurry of glistening ice shards ripped into its hide. Two arms! Oberon's booming voice rose above the roars of the chimera. Knights, hold the beast back. Protect the envoys, quickly. Mab's voice joined the chaos, ordering her subjects to attack. Now more fey were arriving, leaping onto the stage with weapons and battle cries, fangs and teeth bared. Less warrior-type fey scurried off the stage, fleeing for their lives as the others attacked. Trolls and ogres slammed great spiked clubs onto the beast's hide, Red caps sliced it with tarnished bronze knives, and sealy knights brandishing swords of flame cut at its flanks. I saw Ash's brothers join the fray, their ice blades stabbing at the monster's back. The chimera roared again, badly wounded, momentarily cowed by its attackers. Then the dragon's head came up, steam billowing from its jaws, and blasted a stream of liquid fire at the face surrounding it. 
The molten spittle covered several of its attackers, who screamed and fell to the ground, thrashing wildly as the flesh melted from their bones. The monster tried to leave the dance floor, but the fae pressed closer, jabbing at it with their weapons, keeping it in place. As the last of the civilian fay left the stage, the Seelie King stood, his face alien and terrifying, long silver hair whipping behind him. He raised his hands, and a great rumbling shook the ground. Plates clattered and smashed to the ground, trees trembled, and the fay backed away from the snarling monster. The chimera growled and snapped at the air, its eyes wary and confused, as if it were unable to understand what was happening. The stage, four feet of solid marble, splintered with a deafening crack, and huge roots unfurled through the surface. Thick and ancient, covered in gleaming thorns, they wrapped around the chimera like giant snakes digging into its hide. The monster roared raking the living wood with its claws, but the coils continued to tighten. The face swarmed the monster again, hacking and cutting. The chimera fought on, lashing out with deadly claws and fangs, catching those who ventured too close. An ogre smashed his club into the beast's side, but took a savage blow from the monster's paw that tore his shoulder open. A sealy knight cut at the dragon's head, but the jaws opened and it blasted the fairy with molten fire. Screaming, the knight wheeled back, and the dragon raised its head to glare at the Earl King standing at the table, his eyes half-closed in concentration. Its lips curled, and it took a breath. I yelled at Oberon, but my voice was lost in the cacophony, and I knew my warning would come too late. And then Ash was there, dodging the beast's claws, his sword streaking down in an icy blur. It sliced clean through the dragon's neck, severing it, and the head struck the marble with a revolting splat. Ash danced away as the neck continued to writhe, spraying blood and liquid fire from the stump. Fay howled in pain. As Ash retreated from the lava spray, a troll rammed his spear through the lion's open maw and out the back of its head, and a trio of redcaps managed to dodge the flailing claws to swarm the goat's head, biting and stabbing. The chimera jerked, thrashed, and finally slumped into the web of branches, twitching sporadically. Even as it died, the redcaps continued to rip out its flesh. The battle was over, but the carnage remained. Charred, mangled, mutilated bodies lay like broken toys around the fractured stage. Gravely wounded Fay clutched at their injuries, their faces twisted in agony. The smell of blood and burning flesh was overwhelming. My stomach heaved. Twisting my head from the gruesome sight, I crawled to the edge of the stage and vomited into the rose bushes. Oberon! The shriek sent chills through me. Queen Mab was on her feet, eyes blazing, pointing a gloved finger at the Earl King. How dare you! She rasped, and I shivered as the temperature dropped freezing. Frost coated the branches and crept along the ground. How dare you set this monster on us during Elysium! When we come to you under the banner of trust, you've broken the covenant, and I will not forgive this heresy. Oberon looked pained, but Queen Titania leaped to her feet. You dare, she cried, as lightning crackled overhead. You dare accuse us of summoning this creature? This is obviously the work of the unseelie court to weaken us in our own home. Fay began to mutter among themselves, casting suspicious glances at those from another court, though seconds ago they'd fought side by side. A red cap, its mouth dripping black chimera blood, hopped down from the stage to leer at me, beady eyes bright with hunger. I smell human, it crackled, running a purple tongue over its fang. I smell young girl blood and sweeter flesh than a monster's. I hurried away, walking around the stage, but it followed. 
Come to me, little girl. It crooned. Monster flesh is bitter, not like sweet young humans. I just want a nibble, maybe just a finger. Back off. Ash appeared out of nowhere, looking dangerous with dark blood speckling his face. We're in enough trouble without you eating Oberon's daughter. Get out of here. The redcap sneered and scurried off. The fey boy sighed and turned to me, his gaze scanning the length of my dress. Are you hurt? I shook my head. You saved my life, I murmured. I was about to say thank you, but caught myself, since those words seemed to indebt you in fairy. A thought came, unbidden and disturbing. I... I'm not bound to you or anything like that, am I? I asked fearfully. He raised an eyebrow, and I swallowed. No life debt or having to become your wife, right? Not unless your sires made a deal without our knowledge. Ash glanced back at the arguing rulers. Oberon was trying to silence Titania, but she would have none of it, turning her anger on him as well as Mab. And I'd say any contracts that were made were officially broken now. This will probably mean war. War? Something cold touched my cheek, and I glanced up to see snowflakes swirling in a lightning-riddled sky. It was eerily beautiful, and I shivered. What will happen then? Ash stepped closer. His fingers came up to brush the hair from my face, sending an electric shock through me from my spine to my toes. His cool breath tickled my ear as he leaned in. I'll kill you, he whispered, and walked away, joining his brothers at the table. He did not look back. I touched the place where his fingers had brushed my skin, giddy and terrified at the same time. Careful, human. Grimalkin appeared on the corner of the stage, overshadowed by the dead Chimera. Do not lose your heart to a fairy prince. It never ends well. Who asked you? I glared at him. And why do you always pop up when you're not wanted? You got your payment. Why are you still following me? You are amusing, purred Grimalkin. Golden eyes flicked to the bickering rulers and back again. And of great interest to the king and queens. That makes you a valuable pawn indeed. I wonder what you will do next, now that your brother is not in Oberon's territory. I looked at Ash, standing beside his brothers, stone-faced as the argument between Mab and Titania raged on. Oberon was trying to calm them both, but with little success. I have to go to the Unseelie court, I whispered as Grimalkin smiled. I'll have to look for Ethan in Queen Mab's territory. I would imagine so, Grimalkin purred, slitting his eyes at me. Only, you don't know where the Unseelie court is, do you? Mab's entourage came here in flying carriages. How will you find it? I could sneak into one of the carriages, maybe, disguise myself. Grimalkin snorted with laughter. If the red caps do not smell you out, the ogres will. There will be nothing left but bones by the time you reached Tir Nanog. The cat yawned and licked a forepaw. Too bad you lack a guide, someone who knows the way. I stared at the cat, a slow anger building as I realized what it was saying. You know the way to the Unseelie Court. I said quietly. Grimalkin scrubbed a paw over his ears. Perhaps. And you'll take me there, I continued, for a small favor. No, Grimalkin said, looking up at me. There is nothing small about going into unseely territory. My price will be steep, human. Make no mistake about that. So, you must ask yourself... How much is your brother worth to you? 
I fell silent, staring at the table, where the queens were still going at it. Why would I summon the beast? Mab questioned with a sneer at Titania's direction. I've lost loyal subjects as well. Why would I set the creature against my own? Titania matched the other queen's disdain. You don't care who you murder, she said with a sniff. As long as you get what you want in the end. This is a clever ploy to weaken our court without casting suspicion on yourself. Mab swelled in fury and the snow turned to sleet. Now you accuse me of murdering my own subjects. I will not listen to this a moment longer. Oberon! She turned to the Earl King with her teeth bared. Find the one who did this, she hissed, her hair writhing around her like snakes. Find them and give them to me, or face the wrath of the unseemly court. Lady Mab, Oberon said, holding up his hand. Do not be hasty. Surely you realize what this will mean for both of us. Mab's face didn't change. I will wait until Midsummer's Eve, she announced, her expression stony. If the Seely Court does not turn over those responsible for this atrocity to me, then you will prepare yourselves for war. She turned to her sons, who awaited her orders silently. Send for our healers, she told them. Gather our wounded and dead. We will return to Tirnanog tonight. If you are going to decide, Grimalkin said softly, decide quickly. Once they leave, Oberon will not let you go. You are too valuable a pawn to lose to the unseemly court. He will keep you here against your will, under lock and key if he has to, to keep you out of Mab's clutches. After tonight... You may not get another chance to escape, and you will never find your brother. I watched Ash and his brothers disappear into the crowd of Dark Fay, saw the grim, terrifying look on the Earl King's face, and made my decision. I took a deep breath. All right, then. Let's get out of here. Grimalkin stood. Good, he said. We leave now, before the chaos dies down and Oberon remembers you. He looked over my elegant gown and sniffed, wrinkling his nose. I will fetch your clothes and belongings. Wait here, and try not to draw attention to yourself. He twitched his tail, slipped into the shadows, and vanished. I stood by the dead Chimera, looking around nervously and trying to keep out of Oberon's sight, Something small dropped from the lion's mane, glimmering briefly as it caught the light, hitting the marble with a faint clink. Curious, I approached warily, keeping my eye on the huge carcass and the few red caps still gnawing on it. The object on the ground winked metallically as I knelt and picked it up, turning it over in my palm. It looked like a tiny metal bug, round and tick-like, about the size of my pinky nail, its spindly metal legs were curled up over its belly, the way an insect's legs would do when they die. It was covered in black ooze, which I realized with horror was chimera blood. As I stared at it, the legs wiggled, and it flipped over in my hand. I yelped and hurled the bug to the ground where it scuttled over the marble stage, squeezed into a crack, and vanished from sight. I was wiping the chimera blood from my hands, discovering its stained flesh, when Grimalkin appeared, materializing from nowhere with my bright orange backpack. This way, the cat muttered, and led me from the courtyard into a cluster of trees. Hurry and change, he ordered as we ducked beneath the shadowy limbs. We don't have much time. I unzipped the pack and dumped my clothes to the ground, I started to wriggle out of the dress when I noticed Grimalkin still watching me, eyes glowing in the dark. Could I get a little privacy? I asked. The cat hissed. You have nothing I'd be interested in, human. Hurry up.
Scowling, I shed the gown and changed into my old, comfortable clothes. As I jammed my feet into my sneakers, I noticed Grimalkin staring back at the courtyard. A trio of sealy knights wandered toward us across the lawn, and it appeared they were looking for someone. Grimalkin flattened his ears. You've already been missed. This way. I followed the cat through the shadows toward the hedge wall surrounding the courtyard. The brambles peeled back as we approached, revealing a narrow hole in the hedge, just big enough for me to squeeze into on my hands and knees. Grimalkin slipped through without looking back. I grimaced, knelt down, and crawled in after the cat, dragging my backpack behind me. The tunnel was dark and winding. I pricked myself a dozen times as I maneuvered my way through the twisting maze of thorns. Squeezing through a particularly narrow stretch, I cursed as the thorns kept snagging my hair, clothes, and skin. Grimalkin looked over his shoulder, blinking luminous glowing eyes as I struggled. Try not to bleed so much on the thorns, he said as I jabbed myself in the palm and hissed in pain. Right now, anyone could follow us, and you are leaving a very easy trail. Right, because I'm bleeding all over the place for shits and giggles. A bramble caught my hair, and I yanked it free with a painful tearing sound. How much further till we're out? Not far. We are taking a shortcut. This is a shortcut? What does it lead into, Mab's garden or something? Not really. Grimalkin sat down and scratched his ear. This path actually leads us back to your world. I jerked my head up, jabbing myself in the skull and bringing tears to my eyes. What? Are you serious? Relief and excitement flared. I could go home. I could see my mom. She must be worried sick about me. I could go to my own room and... I stopped the balloon of happiness deflating as suddenly as it had come. No, I can't go home yet, I said, feeling my throat tighten. Not without Ethan. I bit my lip, resolved, then glared at the cat. I thought you were taking me to the unseely court, Grim. Grimalkin yawned, sounding bored with it all. I am... The Unseelie Court sits much closer to your world than the Seely territories. It is faster to enter the mortal lands and slip into Tir Nanog from there. Oh. I thought about that for a moment. Well, then, why did Puck take me through the Wildwood? If it's easier to reach the Unseelie Court from my world, why didn't he use that way? Who knows? Trods. The paths into the Never-Never are difficult to find. Some are constantly shifting. Most lead directly into the Wildwood. Only a very few will take you to the Seely or Unseely territories, and they have powerful guardians protecting them. The Trond we are using now is a one-way trip. Once we are through, we will not be able to find it again. Isn't there another way in? Grimalkin sighed. There are other paths to Tir Nanog from the Wildwood, but you would have to deal with the creatures that live there, as you found out with the goblins, and they are not the worst things you could meet. Also, Oberon's guards will be hunting for you, and the Wildwood would be the first place they'll look. The fastest way to the Unseelie Court is the way I'm taking you now. So decide, human. Do you still want to go? Doesn't look like I have a choice, does it? You keep saying that, Grimalkin observed. But there is always a choice, and I suggest we stop talking and keep moving. We are being followed. We kept going, wending our way through the briar tunnel, picking through the thorns until I lost all sense of time and direction. At first I tried avoiding the brambles, snatching at me, but continued to be pricked and poked until I finally gave in and stopped bothering about it. Strangely, once I did, I was scratched a lot less. Once I stopped moving like a snail, Grimalkin set a steady pace through the brambles and I followed as best I could. Occasionally I saw side tunnels spin off in other directions and caught glimpses of shapes moving through the brush, though I never got a clear look. 
We turned a corner and suddenly found a large cement tube in our path. It was a drainage pipe. I could see open air and blue sky through the hole. Oddly, it was sunny on the other side. The mortal world is through there, Grimalkin informed me. Remember, once we are through, we will not be able to return to the Never Never this way. We will have to find another Tron to go back. I know, I said. Grimalkin gave me a long, uncomfortable stare. Also, remember, human, you have been to the Never Never. The glamour over your eyes is gone. Though other mortals will not see anything strange about you, you will see things a little... differently. So try not to overreact. Differently? Like how? Grimalkin smiled. You will see. We emerged from the drainage pipe to the sounds of car engines and street traffic, a shock after being in the wilderness for so long. We were in a downtown area, with buildings looming over us on either side. A sidewalk extended over the drainage pipe. Beyond that, rush hour traffic clogged the roads and people shuffled down the walkway, absorbed in their own small worlds. No one seemed to notice a cat and a scruffy, slightly bloodied teenager crawl out of a drainage ditch. Okay? Despite my worry, I was thrilled to be back in my own familiar world and astounded by the huge glass and metal buildings towering above me. The air here was cold, uncomfortably so, and dirty slush clogged the sidewalks and drains. Craning my neck, I gazed up at the looming skyscrapers, feeling slightly dizzy as they seemed to sway against the sky. There was nothing like this in my tiny Louisiana town. Where are we? Detroit. Grimalkin half-closed his eyes, peering around the town and the people rushing by. One moment. It has been a while since I have been here. Let me think. Detroit, Michigan? Hush. As he was thinking, a large figure in a tattered red hoodie lurched out of the crowd and came toward us, clutching a bottle in a sack. He looked like a homeless person, though I'd never actually seen one. I wasn't too worried. We were on a well-traveled street with a lot of witnesses to hear me scream should he try anything. He would probably ask me for change or a cigarette and keep going. However, as he got close, he raised his head and I saw a wrinkled, bearded face with fangs jutting crookedly from its jaw. In the shadows of the hood, his eyes were yellow and slitted like a cat's. I jumped as the stranger leered and stepped closer. His stench nearly knocked me down. He smelled of roadkill and bad eggs and fish rotting in the sun. I gagged and nearly lost my breakfast. Pretty girl, the stranger growled, reaching out with a claw. You came from there, didn't you? Send me back now. Send me back. I backed away, but Grimalkin leaped between us, fluffed out to twice his size. His yowling screech jerked the man to a halt, and the bum's eyes widened in terror. With a gurgling cry, he turned and ran, knocking people aside as he fled. People cursed and looked around, glaring at one another, but none seemed to notice the fleeing bum. What was that? I asked Grimalkin. A Norgan, the cat sighed. Disgusting things, terrified of cats, if you can believe it. He was probably banished from the Never Never at some point. That would explain his words to you, wanting you to send him back. I looked for the Norgin, but it had vanished into the crowd. Are all the Fey walking around the human world outcasts? I wondered. Of course not. Grimalkin's look was scornful, and no one does scornful better than a cat. Many choose to be here, going back and forth between this world and the Never Never at will, so long as they can find a trod. Some, like brownies or bogarts, haunt a house forever. Others blend into human society, posing as mortals, feeding off dreams, emotions, and talent. Some have been known to marry a particularly exceptional mortal— Though their children are shunned by fairy society, and the fae parent usually leaves if things get too tough. 
Of course, there are those who have been banished to the mortal world. They make their way as best they can, but spending too much time in the human world does strange things to them. Perhaps it is the amount of iron and technology that is so fatal to their existence. They start to lose themselves, a little at a time, until they are only shadows of their former selves, empty husks covered in glamour to make them look real. Eventually, they simply cease to exist. I looked at Gromalkin in alarm. Could that happen to you? To me? I thought of my iPod, remembering the way Tansy leaped away from it in terror. I suddenly recalled the way Robbie was mysteriously absent from all of his computer classes. I'd simply thought he hated typing. I had no idea it was deadly to him. Grimalkin seemed unconcerned. If I stay here long enough, perhaps, maybe in two or three decades, though I certainly do not plan to stay that long. As for you, you are half-human. Your mortal blood protects you from iron and the banal effects of your science and technology. I would not worry too much if I were you. What's wrong with science and technology? Grimalkin actually rolled his eyes. If I thought this would turn into a history lesson, I would have picked a better classroom than a city street. His tail lashed and he sat down. You will never find a fairy at a science fair. Why? Because science is all about proving theories and understanding the universe. Science folds everything into neat, logical, well-explained packages. The fae are magical, capricious, illogical, and unexplainable. Science cannot prove the existence of fairies. So, naturally, we do not exist. That type of non-belief is fatal to fairies. What about Robbie or Puck? I asked, not knowing why he suddenly popped into my head. How did he stay so close to me, going to school and everything, with all the iron around? Grimalkin yawned. Robin Goodfellow is a very old fairy, he said, and I squirmed to think of him like that. Not only that, he has ballads, poems, and stories written about him. So he is very near immortal, as long as humans remember them. Not to say he is immune to iron and technology, far from it. Puck is strong, but even he cannot resist the effects. It would kill him? Slowly, over time. Grimalkin stared at me with solemn eyes. The never-never is dying, human. It grows smaller and smaller every decade. Too much progress, too much technology. Mortals are losing their faith in anything but science. Even the children of man are consumed by progress. They sneer at the old stories and are drawn to the newest gadgets, computers, or video games. They no longer believe in monsters or magic. As cities grow and technology takes over the world, belief and imagination fade away, and so do we. What can we do to stop it? I whispered. Nothing. Grimalkin raised a hind leg and scratched an ear. Maybe the Never Never will hold out till the end of the world. Maybe it will disappear in a few centuries. Everything dies eventually, human. Now, if you are quite done with the questions, we should keep moving. But if the Never Never dies, won't you disappear as well? I am a cat, Grimalkin replied, as if that explained anything. I followed Grimalkin down the sidewalk as the sun set over the horizon and the street lamps flickered to life. I caught glimpses of Fay everywhere, walking past us, hanging out in dark alleys, stealing over the rooftops or skipping along the power lines. I wondered how I could have been so blind before, and I remembered a conversation with Robbie in my living room so long ago, a lifetime ago. Once you start seeing things, you won't be able to stop.
You know what they say. Ignorance is bliss, right? <laughs> if only I'd listened to him then. Grimalkin led me down several more streets and suddenly stopped. Across the street, a two-story dance club, lit with pink and blue neon lights, radiated in the darkness. The sign proclaimed it Blue Chaos. Young men and women lined up outside the club, the lights sparkling off earrings, metal studs, and bleached hair. Music pounded the walls outside. Here we are, Grimalkin said, sounding pleased with himself. The energy around a trod never changes, though when I was here last, this place was different. The trod thingy is the dance club? Inside the dance club, Grimalkin said with a great show of patience. I'll never get in there, I told the feline, looking at the club. The line is like a mile long, and I don't think this is a minor friendly place. I won't make it past the front door. I would think your puck taught you better than this. Grimalkin sighed and slipped into a nearby alley. Confused, I followed, wondering if we were going in another way. But Grimalkin leaped atop an overflowing dumpster and faced me, his eyes floating yellow orbs in the dark. Now, he began lashing his tail. Listen closely, human. You are half fay. More important, you are Oberon's daughter and it is high time you learn to access some of that power everyone is so worried about. I don't have any. Of course you do. Grimalkin's eyes narrowed. You stink of power, which is why Fay react to you so strongly. You just don't know how to use it. Well, I shall teach you, because it will be easier than having to sneak you into the club myself. Are you ready? I don't know. Good enough. First, and Grimalkin's eyes disappeared. Close your eyes. Feeling not a little apprehensive, I did so. Now, reach out and feel the glamour around you. We are very close to the dance club, so glamour is in ready supply from the emotions inside. Glamour is what fuels our power. It is how we change shape sing someone to their death, and appear invisible to mortal eyes. Can you feel it? I don't. Stop talking and just feel. I tried, though I didn't know what I was supposed to experience, sensing nothing but my own discomfort and fear. And then, like an explosion of light on the inside of my eyes, I felt it. It was like color given emotion, orange passion, vermilion lust, crimson anger, blue sorrow, a swirling hypnotic play of sensations in my mind. I gasped and heard Grimalkin's approving purr. Yes, that is glamour, the dreams and emotions of mortals. Now, open your eyes. We are going to start with the simplest of fairy glamour, the power to fade from human sight, to become invisible. Still groggy from the torrent of swirling emotions, I nodded. All right, become invisible. Sounds easy. Grimalkin glared at me. Your disbelief will cripple you if you think like that, human. Do not believe this is impossible, or it will be. All right, all right, I'm sorry. I held up my hands. So, how will I do this? Picture the glamour in your mind. The cat half-slitted its eyes again. Imagine it is a cloak that covers you completely. You can shape the glamour to resemble anything you wish, including an empty space in the air, a spot where no one is standing. As you drape the glamour over yourself, you must believe that no one can see you. Just so. The eyes vanished, along with the rest of the cat. Even knowing Grimalkin was capable of it, it was still eerie seeing him fade from sight right before my eyes. Now. The eyes opened again, and the cat's body followed. Your turn. When you believe you are invisible... 
We will go. What? Don't I get a practice run or something? All it takes is belief, human. If you do not believe you are invisible on the first try, it only gets more difficult. Let us go, and remember, no doubts. Right, no doubts. I took a breath and closed my eyes, willing the glamour to come. I pictured myself fading from sight, swirling a cloak of light and air around my shoulders and pulling up the hood. No one can see me, I thought, trying not to feel foolish. I'm invisible now. I opened my eyes and looked down at my hands. They were still there. Grimalkin shook his head as I looked up in disappointment. I will never understand humans, he muttered. With everything you have seen, magic, fae, monsters, and miracles, you still could not believe you could become invisible. He sighed heavily, leaping off the dumpster. Very well. I suppose I will have to get us in. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook, so please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. Audible Inc. and Harlequin present The Iron King. Written by Julie Kagawa. Read by Christine Vam. Chapter 14 Blue Chaos We stood in line for nearly an hour. All this could have been avoided if you just did what I told you. Grimalkin hissed for about the hundredth time. His claws dug into my arm, and I resisted the urge to drop-kick him over the fence like a football. Give me a break, Grim. I tried, okay? Just drop it already. I ignored the odd stares I was getting from the people around me, listening to the crazy girl muttering to herself. I didn't know what they saw when they looked at Grim, but it certainly wasn't a live-talking cat, and a heavy one at that. A simple invisibility spell. There is nothing easier... Kittens can do it before they walk. I would have said something, but we were approaching the bouncer, who guarded the front doors to Blue Chaos. Dark, muscular, and massive, he checked the ID of the couple in front of us before waving them through. Grim pricked my arm with his claws, and I stepped up. Cold, black eyes raked me up and down. I don't think so, honey, the bouncer said, flexing a muscle in his arm. Why don't you turn around and leave? You have school tomorrow. My mouth was dry, but Grimm spoke up, his voice low and soothing. You are not looking at me right, he purred, though the bouncer didn't glance at him at all. I am actually much older than I look. Yeah? He didn't seem convinced, but at least he wasn't throwing me out by the scruff of my neck. Let's see some ID, then. Of course. Grim poked me, and I shifted his weight to one hand so I could hand my blockbuster card to the bouncer. He snatched it, peering at it suspiciously, while my stomach roiled and cold sweat dripped down my neck. But Grimalkin continued to purr in my arms, completely undisturbed, and the bouncer handed the card back with a grudging look. Yeah, fine. Go on, then. He waved a huge hand at me, and we were through. Inside was chaos. I'd never been to a club before, and was momentarily stupefied by the lights and the noise. Dry ice smoke writhed along the floor, reminding me of the mist that crept through the wildwood. Colored lights turned the dance floor into an electric fantasy land of pink, blue, and gold. Music rattled my ears. I could feel the vibrations in my chest and wondered how anyone could communicate in such a cacophony. Dancers spun, twisted, and swayed on the stage, bouncing in time to the music, sweat and energy pouring off them as they danced. Some danced alone, some in pairs that could not keep their hands off each other, their energy turning to passion. 
among them, writhing and twisting in near frenzies, feeding off the outpouring of glamour, danced the fae. I saw fairies in leather pants and outfits that sparkled, slinked, and were half-torn, far different from the medieval finery of the summer court. A girl with bird-like talons and feathers for hair fluttered through the crowd, slashing young skin and licking the blood. A stick-thin boy with triple-jointed arms wrapped them around a dancing couple, long fingers entwined in their hair. Two fox-eared girls danced together, a mortal between them, their bodies pressed against his. The human's face was flung back in ecstasy, unaware of the hands running over his butt and between his legs. Grimalkin squirmed and jumped out of my arms. He trotted toward the back of the club, his tail looking like a fuzzy periscope navigating the ocean of mist. I followed, trying not to stare at the unearthly dancers spinning among the mass of humanity. Near the bar, a small door with the words staff only stood near the back of the club. I could see the shimmer of glamour around it, making the door difficult to look at. My gaze wanted to slide past. Casually, I approached the door, but before I got too close, the bartender rose up from behind the counter and narrowed his eyes. You don't want to do that, love, he warned. His dark hair was pulled back in a tail, and horns curled up from his brow. He moved to the edge of the bar, and I heard hooves clopping over the wood. Why don't you come over here and I'll fix you something nice? On the house, what do you say? Grimalkin leaped onto a bar stool and put his front paws on the counter. A human on the stool next to him sipped his drink like nothing was happening. We're looking for Shard, Grim said as the bartender shot him an irritated look, turning away from me. Shard is busy, the satyr replied, but he didn't meet Grim's eyes as he said it. And a moment later he began wiping down the bar. Grim continued to stare at him until the satyr looked up, his eyes slitted dangerously. I said she's busy. Now why don't you beat it before I get the red caps to stuff you into a bottle? David, that's no way to treat customers. A cool female voice breathed from behind me, and I jumped. Especially if one is an old friend. The woman behind us was small and slight, with pale skin and neon blue lips that curled sardonically at the edges. Her spiky hair stuck out at every angle, its dyed shades of blue, green, and white resembling ice crystals growing out of her scalp. She wore tight leather pants, a midriff tee that barely covered her breasts, and a dagger on one thigh. Her face glittered from countless piercings, Eyebrows, nose, lips, and cheeks, all silver or gold. Her long ears sparkled with rings, studs, and bars, enough to make any metalhead weep from envy. A silver bar lanced through her belly button, and a tiny dragon pendant dangled from it. Hello, Grimalkin, the woman said, sounding resigned. It's been a while, hasn't it? What brings you to my humble club? and with the summer whelp in tow. Her eyes, scintillating blue and green, looked me over curiously. We need passage into Tirnanog, Grimalkin said without hesitation. Tonight, if you can. Don't ask for much, do you? Shard grinned, motioning us into a corner booth. Once seated, she leaned back and snapped her fingers. A human, lean and gangly, melted out of the shadows to stand beside her, his face slack with adoration. Apple teeny, she told him. Spill it and spend the rest of your days as a roach. Do you want anything? No, Grimalkin said firmly. I shook my head. The human scurried off and Shard leaned forward, her blue lips curved in a smile. So, passage to Winter's Territory. You want to use my trod, is that correct? It is not your trod, Grimalkin said, thumping his tail against the booth cushions. But it is under my dance club, Shard replied. And the Winter Queen won't be pleased if I let the summer whelp into her territory unannounced. Don't look at me like that, Grim. I'm not stupid. I know the daughter of the Earl King when I see her.
So the question is, what do I get out of this? A favor repaid. Grimalkin narrowed his eyes at her. Your debt to me cancelled. That's fine for you, Shard said, and turned her leer on me. But what about this one? What can she offer? I swallowed. What do you want? I asked before Grimalkin could say anything. The cat shot me an exasperated glare, but I ignored him. If anyone would barter away my fate, it would be me. I didn't want Grimalkin promising this woman my firstborn child without my consent. Shard leaned back again, crossing her legs with a smile. The gangly boy appeared with her drink, a green concoction with a tiny umbrella, and she sipped it slowly, her eyes never leaving mine. Hmm, that's a good question, Shard murmured, swirling her teeny thoughtfully. What do I want of you? It must be awfully important for you to get into Mab's territory. What would that be worth? She took another sip, appearing deep in thought. How about... Your name? She offered at last. I blinked. My... My name? That's right. Shard smiled disarmingly. Nothing much. Just promise me the use of your name, your true name, and we'll call it even, yes? The girl is young, Shard, Grimalkin said, watching us both with slitted eyes. She might not even know her true calling yet. That's all right. Shard smiled at me. Just give me the name you call yourself now, and we'll make do, yes? I'm sure I can find some use for it. No, I told her. No deal. You're not getting my name. Oh, well. Shard shrugged and raised the glass to her lips. I guess you'll have to find another way into Mab's territory then. She shifted toward the end of the booth. It has been a pleasure. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've a club to run. Wait, I blurted out. Shard paused, watching me expectantly. All right, I whispered. All right, I'll give you a name. After that, you'll open the trod, right? The fairy smiled, showing her teeth. Of course. Are you sure you want to do this? Grimalkin asked softly. Do you know what happens when you give a fairy your name? I ignored him. Swear it. I told Shard. Promise that you'll open the trod once I give you the name. Say the words. The fairy's smile turned vicious. Not as stupid as she first appears, she muttered and shrugged. Very well. I, Shard, keeper of the chaos trod, do swear to open the path once I have received payment in the form of a single name, spoken by the requesting party. She broke off and smirked at me. Good enough? I nodded. Fine. Shard licked her lips, looking inhumanly eager as her eyes gleamed. Now, give me the name. All right. I took a deep breath as my stomach twisted wildly. Fred Flintstone. Shard's face went blank. What? For one glorious moment, she looked utterly bewildered. That is not your name, Half-Blood. That's not what we agreed on. My heart pounded. Yes, it is, I told her, keeping my voice firm. I promise to give you a name, not my name. I've upheld my end of the contract. You have your name. Now show us the trod. Beside me, Grimalkin started sneezing, a sudden explosion of feline laughter. Shard's face remained blank a moment longer. Then cold rage crept into her features and her eyes turned black. Her quills bristled, and ice coated the glass in her hand before it shattered into a million sparkling pieces. You! Her gaze stabbed into me, cold and terrifying, 
I fought the urge to run screaming out of the club. You will regret this insolence, half-breed. I will not forget this, and will make you beg for mercy until your throat is raw from it. My legs trembled, but I stood and faced her. Not before you show us the trod. Grimalkin stopped laughing and jumped onto the table. You have been out-negotiated, Shard, he said, his voice still thick with amusement. Cut your losses and try again some other time. Right now, we need to be going. The fairy's eyes still glimmered black, but she made a visible effort to control herself. Very well, she said with great dignity. I will uphold my end of the bargain. Wait here a moment. I need to inform David that I'll be gone for a bit. She stalked away with her chin in the air, her spines quivering like icicles. Very clever, Grimalkin said softly as the fairy marched toward the bar. Shard has always been too rash, never pausing to listen for important details. She thinks she's too smart for that. Still, it is never wise to anger a winter she. You might regret your little battle of wits before this is over. The Fae never forget an insult. I remained silent, watching Shard lean over and whisper something to the satyr. David looked up at me, eyes narrowing, before jerking his head once and turning to wipe the counter. Shard returned. Her eyes were normal again, though they still glared at me with cold dislike. This way she announced frostily, and led us across the room toward the staff-only door on the far wall. We followed her down five or six flights of stairs, pausing at another door with the words, Danger, Keep Out, painted on the surface in bright red. Shard looked back at me with an evil little smile. Don't mind Grumley. He's our latest deterrent against those who poke their noses where they don't belong. Occasionally, some puka or red cap will think themselves clever and sneak past David to see what's down here. Obviously, I can't have that, so I use Grumley to dissuade them. She chuckled. Sometimes a mortal will find his way down here as well. That's the best entertainment. It cuts down on his food bill, too. She gave me a razor-sharp grin and pushed the door open. The stench hit me like a giant hammer, a revolting mix of rot and sweat and excrement. I recoiled and my stomach heaved. Bones littered the stone floor, some human, some decidedly not. A pile of dirty straw lay in one corner next to a door on the far wall. I knew that was the entrance to the unseelie territory, but reaching it would be a real challenge. Chained to a ring in the floor... Manacled by one tree stump leg, was the biggest ogre I'd ever seen. His skin was bruise purple, and four yellow tusks curled from his lower jaw. His torso was massive, muscles and tendons rippling under his mottled hide, and his thick fingers ended in curved black claws. He also wore a heavy collar around his throat, the skin underneath red and raw, showing old scars where he'd clawed at it. A moment later, I realized both the collar and the manacles were made of iron. The ogre limped across the room, favoring the chained leg as he moved, his ankle festering with blisters and open sores. Grimalkin gave a small hiss. Interesting, he said. Is the ogre really that strong to be bound that way? He's escaped a few times in the past, before we started using the iron, Shard replied, looking pleased with herself. Smashed the club to bits, and ate a few patrons before we stopped him. I thought drastic measures were called for. Now he behaves himself. It is killing him. Grimalkin's voice was flat. You must realize this will considerably shorten his lifespan. Don't lecture me, Grimalkin. Shark gave the cat a disgusted look and stepped through the door. If I didn't keep him here, he'd only be rampaging somewhere else. The iron won't kill him right away. Ogres heal so fast. She sauntered up to the ogre, who glared at her with pain-filled yellow eyes. 
Move, she ordered it, pointing toward the pile of straw in the corner. Go to your bed, Grumley. Now. The ogre stared at her, snarled feebly, and shuffled to his bed, the chain clinking behind him. I couldn't help but feel a little sorry for him. Shard opened the door, a long hallway stretched beyond the door, and mist flowed through the opening into the room. Well, she called back to us, here's your trod to the winter territory. Are you going to stand there or what? Keeping a wary eye on Grumley, I started forward. Wait, Grimalkin muttered. What's the matter? I turned and found him scanning the room, eyes narrowed to slits. Afraid of the ogre? Shard will keep him off us, right? Not at all, the cat replied. Her bargain is done. She just opened the path to Tirnanog for us. She never promised us protection. I looked into the room again and found Grumley staring at us, drool dripping to the floor from his teeth. On the other side, Shard was smirking at me. There was a sudden clatter on the stairs, the sound of many feet skipping down the steps. Over the railing, a wrinkled, evil face peered down at me, shark teeth gleaming. A red bandana fell off its head to land at my feet. Red caps, I gasped, stepping into the room without thinking. Grumley roared, surging to the end of his chain, raking the ground with his claws. I yelped and flattened myself against the wall as the ogre snarled and slashed at the air, straining to reach me. His huge fists pounded the floor not ten feet away, and he bellowed in frustration. I couldn't move. Grimalkin had disappeared. Shard's laughter rang in the air as a dozen redcaps swarmed into the room. Now, she said, leaning against the doorframe, this is entertainment. Chapter 15 Puck's Return the redcaps crowded through the doorway, teeth flashing in the dim light. They wore biker jackets and leather pants and sported crimson bandanas instead of their trademark caps. Snarling and gnashing their teeth, they spotted Grumley at the same time the ogre noticed them and leaped back as a huge fist pounded the pavement. Snarls and curses rose in the air. The redcaps danced madly out of the ogre's reach, brandishing bronze knives and wooden baseball bats. What is this? I heard one of them screech. Goatman promised us young flesh if we followed the stairs. Where is our meat? There, snarled another, pointing at me with what looked like a tarnished shiv. In the corner. Don't let the monster get our meat. They slid toward me, hugging the wall as I had done, keeping out of the ogre's grasp. Grumley roared and slashed the ground, raking deep trenches into the cement floor. But the redcaps were small and quick, and he couldn't reach them. I watched in horror as the hideous fae swarmed toward me, laughing and waving their weapons, and I couldn't move. I was about to be eaten alive, but if I ventured any farther into the room, Grumley would tear me apart. Through it all, I was aware of Shard, lounging in the other doorway, a self-satisfied smirk on her face. Do you like where our contract has gone, little bitch? She called over the bellows of Grumley and the clattering teeth of the redcaps. Throw me your real name and I might call them off. One of the redcaps leaped at me, jaws gaping, springing right for my face. I threw up my arm and the jagged teeth sank into my flesh, clamping down like a steel trap. Shrieking, I flailed wildly, dislodging the repulsive weight and flinging it at the ogre. The redcap hit the ground and leaped to his feet, snarling, just as Grumley's fist smashed him into bloody paste. Time seemed to slow down. I guess that happens when you're about to die. The redcaps surged forward, shark teeth grinning and clacking. Grumley bellowed at the end of his chain, and Shard leaned against the doorframe and laughed. A huge black bird flapped through the open door. The redcaps leaped. 
The bird dove, sinking its talons into a red cap's face, shrieking and flapping its wings. Startled and confused, the red caps hesitated as the bird thrashed about, beating its wings and stabbing at the fairy's eyes with its beak. The pack hooted and slugged at it with their bats, but the bird darted up at the last second, and the red cap howled as the weapon slammed into him instead. In the confusion, the bird exploded, changing shape in midair. A body dropped between me and the red caps, shedding black feathers and giving me a familiar grin. Hi, princess. Sorry I'm late. Traffic was a bitch. Puck! He winked at me, then shot a glance at the winter she, standing in the doorway. Hey, shard, he waved. Nice place you've got here. I'll have to remember it so I can give it the special puck touch. It's an honor to have you, Robin Goodfellow, shard answered, grinning evilly. If the red caps leave your head intact, I'll mount it over the bar so everyone can see it when they come in. Kill him. Snarling, the red caps leaped, teeth flashing like piranhas swarming a drowning bird. Puck pulled something out of his pocket and tossed it. It exploded into a thick log, and the red caps clamped their jaws around the wood, teeth sinking into the bark. With muffled yelps, they clattered to the floor. Fetch, Puck called. Shrieking with rage, the red caps splintered the log, shredding it like buzz saws. Teeth chattering, they spit wood chips and glared at us murderously. Puck turned to me with an apologetic look. Excuse me a moment, princess. I have to go play with the puppies. He stepped toward them, grinning, and the red caps lunged, brandishing knives and baseball bats. Puck waited until the last second before he dodged, into the room and away from the wall. The pack followed. I gasped as Grumley's fist hammered down. But Puck leapt aside just in time, and a red cap was smashed flatter than a pancake. Whoops! Puck exclaimed, putting both hands to his mouth, even as he sidestepped Grumley's second swing. Clumsy of me! The red cap snarled curses and lunged at him again. They continued this deadly dance around the room, Puck leading the red caps on with taunts, laughter, and cheers. Grumley roared and smashed his fists at the little men scurrying around his feet, but the red caps were quick and now wary of the danger. This didn't stop them from launching an all-out attack on Puck, who danced, dodged, and pirouetted his way around the ogre, almost seeming to enjoy himself. My heart stayed lodged in my throat the whole time. One wrong move, one miscalculation, and Puck would be a bloody smear on the floor. The air around me chilled. I'd been so focused on Puck I didn't realize Shard had slipped away from the doorframe and was now a few feet away. Her eyes glimmered black, and her lips curled in a smile as she raised a hand. A long spear of ice formed overhead, angled at me. There was a yowl, and an invisible weight must have thumped onto her back, for she staggered and nearly fell. Something flashed golden on her chest. A key, attached to a thin silver chain. With a curse, Shard flung the invisible assailant into the wall. There was a thud and a hiss of pain, as Grimalkin materialized for a split second and winked out of sight again. In that moment of distraction, I lunged, grabbing the key around her neck. She turned with blinding speed, and a pale white hand clamped around my throat. I gasped, clawing at her arm with my free hand, but it seemed to be made of stone. Her skin burned with cold. Ice crystals formed on my neck as Shard slowly tightened her grip, smiling. I sank to my knees as the room began to dim. With a fierce screech, Grimalkin landed on her back, sinking claws and teeth into her neck. Shard screamed, and the pressure on my throat disappeared. Lurching upright, I shoved the she with all my might, pushing her away. There was a jerk and a tiny snap, and the key came loose in my hand. Coughing, I staggered away from the wall, looking up at the ogre. Grumly? I yelled, my voice raw and hoarse. Grumly, look at me. Listen to me. The ogre stopped pounding the floor and swung his tormented gaze to me. 
Behind me, a feline yowl cut through the air, and Grimalkin's body tumbled to the floor. Help us, I cried, holding up the key. It winked golden in the light. Help us, Grumley, and we'll free you. We'll set you free. Free me? Something smashed into the back of my head, nearly knocking me out. I collapsed, clutching the key as pain raged across my senses. Something kicked me in the ribs, flipping me to my back. Shard loomed overhead, her dagger in one raised hand. No. Grimley's bellow filled the room. Startled, Shard looked up, just realizing she was within the ogre's reach. Too late. Grumley's back hand smashed into her chest, hurling her into the wall with a nasty thud. Even the red cap stopped chasing Puck around and looked back. I scrambled to my feet, ignoring the way my muscles screamed in protest. I staggered toward Grumley, hoping the ogre wouldn't forget and smash me into pudding. He didn't move as I reached the chains, the cruel iron manacle digging into his flesh. Shoving the key into the hole, I turned it until it clicked. The iron band loosened and dropped away. Grumley roared, a roar filled with triumph and rage. He spun, surprisingly quick for his bulk, and kicked a red cap into the wall. Puck scrambled out of the way as the ogre raised a foot and stomped two more like roaches. The red caps went berserk. Snarling and screeching, they swarmed Grumley's feet, pounding them with bats and sinking teeth into his ankles. Grumley stomped and kicked, barely missing me, and the ground shook with his blows. But I didn't have the strength to move. Dodging the carnage, Puck grabbed me and pulled me away from the battle. Let's go, he muttered, looking back over his shoulder. While they're distracted, head for the trod. What about Grimalkin? I am here the cat said, appearing beside me. His voice sounded strained, and he favored his left forepaw, but otherwise seemed fine. It is definitely time to leave. We staggered toward the open door, but found our path blocked by Shard. No, the she growled. Her left arm hung limp, but she raised an ice spear and angled it at my chest. You will not pass. You will die here, and I will nail you to the wall for everyone to see. A rumbling growl echoed behind us, and heavy footsteps shook the ground. Grumley, Shard said without taking her eyes from me. Kill them. All is forgiven. Rip them apart. Slowly. Do it now. Grumley growled again and a thick leg landed next to me. Friends, the ogre rumbled standing over us. Free Grumly, Grumly's friends. He took another step, the raw, chafed wound on his leg smelling of gangrene and rot. Kill, mistress, he growled. What? Shard backed away, her eyes widening. Grumley shuffled forward, raising his huge fists. What are you doing? Get back, you stupid thing! I command you! No! No! Let's go, Puck whispered, tugging my arm. We ducked under Grumley's legs and sprinted for the open door. The last thing I saw as the door closed behind us was Grumley looming over his former master and Shard bringing up her spear as she backed away. The corridor stretched away before us, filled with mist and flickering lights. I slumped against the wall, shaking as the adrenaline wore off. You all right, princess? Puck asked, green eyes bright with concern. I staggered forward and threw my arms around him, hugging him tightly. He wrapped his arms around me and pulled me close, I felt his warmth and the rapid beat of his heart, his breath against my ear. Finally, I pulled away and sank back against the wall, drawing him down with me. I thought Oberon changed you into a bird, I whispered. He did, Puck answered with a shrug. But when he discovered you had run away, he sent me to find you.
So, it was you I heard following us, Grimalkin said, nearly invisible in the mist. Puck nodded. I figured you were heading for the Unseelie Court. Who do you think created that shortcut? Anyway, once I was out, I sniffed around and a pisky told me he saw you heading for this part of town. I knew Shard owned a club here, and the rest, as the mortals say, is history. I'm glad you came, I said, standing up. My legs felt a bit stronger now, and the shaking had almost stopped. You saved my life. Again. And I know you might not want to hear it, but thanks. Puck gave me a sidelong glance that I didn't like at all. Don't thank me just yet, princess. Oberon was quite upset that you had left the safety of the Seely territories. He rubbed his hands and looked uncomfortable. I'm supposed to bring you back to court. I stared at him, feeling as though he'd just kicked me in the stomach. But you won't, right? I stammered. He looked away, and my desperation grew. Puck, you can't. I have to find Ethan. I have to go to the Unseely Court and bring him home. Puck scrubbed a hand through his hair, a strangely human gesture. You don't understand, he said, sounding uncharacteristically unsure. I'm Oberon's favorite lackey, but I can only push him so far. If I fail him again... I might end up a lot worse than a raven for two centuries. He could banish me from the never-never for all time. I'd never be able to go home. Please, I begged, taking his hand. He still didn't look at me. Help us. Puck, I've known you forever. Don't do this. I dropped his hand and stared at him, narrowing my eyes. You realize you'll have to drag me back kicking and screaming and I'll never speak to you again. Don't be like that. Puck finally looked up. You don't realize what you're doing. If Mab finds you, you don't know what she's capable of. I don't care. All I know is my brother is still out there, in trouble. I have to find him. And I'm going to do it with or without your help. Puck's eyes glittered. I could cast a charm spell over you, he mused, one corner of his lip quirking up. That would solve a lot of problems. No. Grimalkin spoke up before I could explode. You will not, and you know you will not, so stop posturing. Besides, I have something that might solve this little problem. Oh? A favor. Grimalkin waved his tail languidly. From the king. That won't stop Oberon from banishing me. No, Grimalkin agreed. But I could request that you be banished for a limited time only. A few decades or so. It is better than nothing. Uh-huh. Puck sounded unconvinced. And this would just cost me a small favor in return, is that right? You pulled me into this conflict the moment you dropped this girl into my tree, Grimalkin said, blinking lazily. I cannot believe that was an act of coincidence, not from the infamous Robin Goodfellow. You should have known it might come to this. I know better than to make deals with a cat she, Puck shot back, then sighed, scrubbing a hand over his eyes. Fine, he said at last. You win, princess. Freedom is highly overrated anyway. If I'm going to do anything, I might as well do it big. My heart lifted. So you'll help us? Sure, why not? Puck gave me a resigned smile. You'd get eaten alive without me. Besides, storming the unseelie court? His grin widened. Can't pass that up for anything. Then let us go. Grimalkin said as Puck pulled me to my feet. The longer we tarry, the farther word will spread about our intentions. Tirna Nog is not far now. He turned and trotted down the corridor, his tail held upright in the fog. We followed the hallway for several minutes. After a while, the air turned cold and sharp, 
Frost coated the walls of the corridor, and icicles dangled from the ceiling. We are getting close, came Grimalkin's disembodied voice in the mist. The hallway ended with a simple wooden door. A thin powder of snow lined the bottom crack, and the door trembled and creaked in the wind howling just outside. Puck stepped forward. Ladies and felines, he stated grandly, grasping the doorknob. Welcome to Tir Nanog, land of endless winters and shitloads of snow. A billow of freezing powder caressed my face as he pulled the door open. Blinking away ice crystals, I stepped forward. I stood in a frozen garden, the thorn bushes on the fence coated with ice, a cherub fountain in the center of the yard, spouting frozen water. In the distance, beyond the barren trees and thorny scrub, I saw the pointed roof of a huge Victorian estate. I glanced back for Grimm and Puck and saw them standing under a trellis hung with purple vines and crystal blue flowers. As they stepped through, the corridor vanished behind them. Charming! Puck commented, gazing around in distaste. I love the barren dead feel they're going for. Who's the gardener, I wonder? I'd love to get some tips. I was already shivering. How far are we from Queen Mab's court? I asked, my teeth chattering. The winter court is maybe two days' walk from here, Grimalkin said, leaping onto a tree stump. He shook his paws one by one and sat down carefully. We should find shelter soon. I am uncomfortable in this weather, and the girl will certainly freeze to death. A dark chuckle echoed across the garden. I wouldn't worry about that now. A figure stepped out from behind a tree, sword held loosely in one hand. My heart skipped a beat and then picked up again louder and more irregular than before. The breeze ruffled the figure's black hair as he moved toward us, graceful and silent as a shadow. Grimalkin hissed and disappeared, and Puck shoved me behind him. I've been waiting for you, Ash murmured into the silence. Chapter 16 The Iron Fay Ash, I whispered as the lean, stealthy figure glided toward us, his boots making no sound in the snow. He was devastatingly gorgeous, dressed all in black, his pale face seeming to float over the ground. I remembered the way he smiled, the look in his silver eyes as we danced. He wasn't smiling now, and his eyes were cold. This wasn't the prince I'd danced with Elysium Night. This wasn't anything but a predator. Ash, Puck repeated in a conversational tone, though his face had gone hard and feral. What a surprise to see you here. How did you find us? It wasn't difficult. Ash sounded bored. The princess mentioned that she was looking for someone within Mab's court. There are only so many ways into Tir Nanog from the mortal world, and Shard doesn't exactly make it a secret that she guards the trod. I figured it was only a matter of time before you came here. Very clever, Puck said, smirking. But then, you were always the strategist, weren't you? What do you want, Ash? Your head, Ash answered softly. On a pike. But what I want doesn't matter this time. He pointed his sword at me. I've come for her. I gasped as my heart and stomach began careening around my chest. He's here for me. To kill me, like he promised at Elysium. Over my dead body, Puck smiled, as if this was a friendly conversation on the street, but I felt muscles coiling under his skin. That was part of the plan. The prince raised his sword, the icy blade wreathed in mist, I will avenge her today and put her memory to rest. For a moment, a shadow of anguish flitted across his face, and he closed his eyes. When he opened them, they were cold and glittered with malice. 
prepare yourself. Stay back, princess, Puck warned, pushing me out of the way. He reached into his boot and pulled out a dagger, the curved blade clear as glass. This might get a little rough. Puck, no. I clutched at his sleeve. Don't fight him. Someone could die. Duels to the death tend to end that way, Puck grinned, but it was a savage thing, grim and frightening. But I'm touched that you care. One moment, princeling, he called to Ash, who inclined his head. Taking my wrist, Puck steered me behind the fountain and bent close, his breath warm on my face. I have to do this, princess, he said firmly. Ash won't let us go without a fight, and this has been coming for a long time now. For a moment, a shadow of regret flickered across his face, but then it was gone. So, he murmured, grinning as he tilted my chin up. Before I march off to battle, how about a kiss for luck? I hesitated, wondering why now, of all times, he would ask for a kiss. He certainly didn't think of me in that way. Did he? I shook myself. There was no time to wonder about that. Leaning forward, I kissed him on the cheek. His skin was warm and bristly with stubble. Don't die, I whispered, pulling back. Puck looked disappointed, but only for a second. Me? Die? Didn't they tell you, princess? I'm Robin Goodfellow. With a whoop, he flourished his knife and charged the waiting prince. Ash lunged, a dark blur across the snow, his sword hissing down in a vicious arc. Puck leaped out of the way, and the blow sent a miniature blizzard arching toward me. I gasped, the freezing spray stinging like needles, and rubbed at my burning eyes. When I could open them again, Ash and Puck were deep in battle, and it looked like each was intent on killing the other. Puck ducked a savage blow and tossed Ash something from his pocket— it erupted into a large boar, squealing madly as it charged the prince, tusks gleaming. The ice sword hammered into it, and the boar exploded in a swirl of dry leaves. Ash flung out his arm, and a spray of glittering ice shards flew toward Puck like daggers. I cried out, but Puck inhaled and blew in their direction, like he was blowing out a birthday candle. The shards shimmered into daisies, raining harmlessly around him, and he grinned. Ash attacked viciously, his blade singing as he bore down on his opponent. Puck dodged and parried with his dagger, retreating before the onslaught of the Winter Prince. Diving away, Puck snatched a handful of twigs from the base of the tree, blew on them and tossed them into the air. And now there were three Pucks, grinning wickedly as they set upon their opponent. Three knives flashed, three bodies surrounded the Dark Prince— as the real Puck leaned against the tree and watched Ash struggle. But Ash was far from beaten. He spun away from the Pucks, his sword a blur as he dodged and parried, whirling from one attack to the next. He ducked beneath an opponent's guard, ripped his blade up, and sliced cleanly through a Puck's stomach. The doppelganger split in two, changing into a severed stick that dropped away. Ash spun to meet the Puck rushing up from the side, his sword whirled, and Puck's head dropped from his shoulders before reverting to a twig. The last Puck charged the prince from behind, dagger raised high. Ash didn't even turn, but rammed his blade backward, point up. Puck's lunge carried him into the blade and drove it through his stomach, the point erupting out his back. The prince yanked the sword free without turning, and a shattered twig dropped to the snow. Ash lowered his sword gazing around warily. Following his gaze, I gave a start. Puck had disappeared, pulling a grimalkin while we were distracted. Instantly wary, the Winter Prince scanned the garden, edging forward with his sword raised. His gaze flicked to me, and I tensed. But he dismissed me almost as quickly, stepping beneath the boughs of a frozen pine. As Ash stepped under the branches, something leaped out of the snow, howling, the prince dodged, the knife barely missing him, and Puck overbalanced, stumbling forward. With a snarl, Ash drove the point of the sword through Puck's back and out his chest, pinning him to the ground. I screamed, but as I did, the body vanished. 
For a split second, Ash stared at the pierced leaf on his sword tip, then threw himself to the side as something dropped from the tree, dagger flashing in the light. Puck's laughter rang out as Ash rolled to his feet, clutching his arm. Blood seeped between pale fingers. Almost too slow that time, Prince, Puck mocked, balancing the dagger on two fingers. Really, that's the oldest trick in the book. I know, cause I wrote the book. I've got a million more if you want to keep playing. I'm getting tired of sparring with copies. Ash straightened, dropping his hand. I guess honor isn't as prevalent in the Seely Court as I thought. Are you the real Puck? Or is he too cowardly to face me himself? Puck regarded him disdainfully before shimmering into nothingness. Another Puck stepped out from behind a tree, a nasty grin on his face. All right then, Prince, he said, smirking as he approached. If that's what you want, I'll kill you the old-fashioned way. And they flew at each other again. I watched the battle, my heart in my throat, wishing I could do something. I didn't want either of them to die, but I had no idea how to stop this. Shouting or rushing between them seemed like a really bad idea. One could be distracted and the other would waste no time finishing him off. A sick despair churned in my stomach. I hadn't realized Puck was so bloodthirsty, but the mad gleam in his eyes told me he would kill the Winter Prince if he could. They have a history, I realized, watching Ash cut viciously at Puck's face, barely missing as his opponent ducked. Something happened between them to make them hate each other. I wonder if they were ever friends. My skin prickled, an uneasy shiver from more than the cold. Over the clang and screech of metal, I heard something else, a faint rustling, as if a thousand insects were scuttling toward us. Run! Grimalkin's voice made me jump. Tracks appeared in the snow, rushing toward me, and invisible claws scrabbled against bark as the feline fled up a tree. Something is coming! Hide! Quickly! I glanced at Puck and Ash, still locked in combat. The rustling grew louder, accompanied by static and faint, high-pitched laughter. Suddenly, through the trees, hundreds of eyes glowed electric green in the darkness, surrounding us. Puck and Ash stopped fighting and broke apart, finally aware that something was wrong. But it was too late. They poured over the ground like a living carpet, appearing from everywhere. Small, black-skinned creatures with spindly arms, huge ears, and razor grins that shone blue-white in the darkness. I heard the boy's cries of shock and Grimalkin's yowl of horror as he fled farther up the tree. The creatures spotted me, and I had no time to react. They swarmed me like angry wasps, crawling up my legs, hurling themselves onto my back. I felt claws dig into my skin, my ears filled with loud buzzing and shrieking laughter, and I screamed, thrashing wildly. I couldn't see, didn't know which way was up. The weight of their bodies bore me down, and I fell onto a grasping, wriggling mass. Hundreds of hands lifted me up, like ants carrying a grasshopper and began to cart me away. Puck! I screamed, struggling to free myself. But whenever I rolled away from one group, a dozen more slid in to take their place, bearing me up. I never touched the ground. Grimalkin, help! Their cries seemed distant and far away. Carried on a buzzing, living mattress, I glided rapidly over the ground and into the waiting darkness. I don't know how long they carried me. When I struggled, the claws gripping me would dig into my skin, turning the mattress into a bed of needles. I soon ceased thrashing about and tried to concentrate on where they were taking me. But it was difficult. Being carried on my back, the only thing I saw clearly was the sky. I tried to turn my head, but the creatures had their claws sunk into my hair and would yank on it until tears formed in my eyes. I resigned myself to lying still, shivering with cold, waiting to see what would happen. The cold and the gnawing worry drained me. I allowed my eyes to slip closed and found solace in the darkness. 
When I opened my eyes again, the night sky had disappeared, replaced by a ceiling of solid ice. I realized we were traveling underground. The air grew even colder as the tunnel opened up into a magnificent ice cavern, glistening with a jagged alien beauty. Huge icicles dripped from the ceiling, some longer than I was tall and wickedly sharp. It was a tad disturbing passing under those bristling spikes, watching them sparkle like crystal chandeliers, praying they wouldn't fall. My teeth chattered, and my lips were numb with cold. However, as we traveled deeper into the cave, the air gradually warmed. A faint noise echoed through the lower caverns, a roaring, hissing sound, like steam escaping a cracked pipe. Water dripped from the ceiling in rivulets now, soaking my clothes, and some of the ice shards looked dangerously unstable. The hissing grew louder, punctuated with great roaring coughs and the acrid smell of smoke. Now I saw that some of the icicles had indeed fallen, smashed to pieces on the ground and glittering like broken glass. My abductors brought me into a large cavern littered with shattered shards of ice. Puddles saturated the floor, and water fell like rain from the ceiling. The creatures dropped me to the icy ground and scuttled off. I rubbed my numb, aching limbs and looked around, wondering where I was. The cave was mostly empty, save for a wooden box filled with black rocks. Coal? In one corner. More were stacked along the far wall, next to a wooden archway that led off into the darkness. A piercing whistle, like a steam engine roaring into the station, erupted from the tunnel, and black smoke churned from the opening. I smelled ashes and brimstone, and then a deep voice echoed through the cavern, Have you brought her? The scuttling creature scattered, and several icicles smashed the floor with an almost musical chime. I ducked behind an ice column as heavy footsteps clanked down the tunnel. Through the smoke, I saw something huge and grossly distorted, something definitely not human, and shook in terror. A massive black horse emerged from the writhing smoke, eyes glowing like hot coals, flared nostrils blowing steam. It was as big as the horses that pulled the Budweiser wagon, but there the resemblance ended. At first, I thought it was covered in iron plates. Its hide was bulky with metal, rusted, and black, and it moved awkwardly with the weight. Then I realized its body was made of iron. Pistons and gears jutted out from its ribs. Its mane and tail were steel cables. A great fire burned in its belly, visible through the chinks in its hide. Its face was a terrifying mask as it turned to me, blasting flame from its nostrils. I fell back, certain I was going to die. Are you Megan Chase? The horse's voice shook the room. More icicles committed suicide, but they were the least of my worries. I cringed back as the iron monster loomed over me, tossing its head in snorting flame. Answer me, human. Are you Megan Chase, daughter of the Summer King? Yes, I whispered as the horse moved closer, iron hooves pounding the ice. Who are you? What do you want with me? I am Iron Horse, the beast replied. One of King Machina's lieutenants. I have brought you here because my lord has requested it. You will come with me to see the Iron King. The booming voice was giving me a headache. I tried to focus through the pounding in my skull. The Iron King? I asked stupidly. Who? King Machina. Iron Horse confirmed. Sovereign Lord of the Iron Court and Ruler of the Iron Fay. Iron Fay? A chill slid up my spine. I looked around at the countless eyes of the gremlin-like monsters to the massive bulk of Iron Horse and felt dizzy at the implications. Iron Fay? Could there be such a thing? 
In all the stories, poems, and plays, I'd never encountered anything like this. Where did they come from? And who was this Mackinac, ruler of the Iron Fay? More important, what does he want with me? It is not mine to know, Iron Horse snorted, swishing its tail with a clanking sound. I only obey. However, you would be wise to come with us if you wish to see your brother again. Ethan? I jerked my head up, glaring at Iron Horse's expressionless mask. How do you know about him? I demanded. Is he all right? Where is he? Come with me, and all your questions will be answered. The Iron Court and my Lord Machina await. I stood as Iron Horse turned, clanking back toward the tunnel. Its pistons creaked and the gears complained loudly as it shuffled forward. It was old, I realized, watching a bolt come loose and fall to the ground. A relic of days gone by. I wondered if there were newer, sleeker models out there, and what they looked like. Faster, better, more superior Iron Fay. After a moment, I decided I didn't want to find out. Iron Horse stood at the mouth of the tunnel, stamping impatiently. Sparks flew from its hooves as it glowered at me. Come, it ordered with a blast of steam from its nostrils. Follow the trod to the Iron Court. If you will not walk, the gremlins will carry you. It tossed its head and reared, flames shooting out its muzzle. Or perhaps I will run behind you, breathing fire. An ice spear flew through the air, striking Iron Horse between the ribs, bursting into steam as the fire engulfed it. The horse screamed, a high-pitched whistle, and whirled, hooves sparking as they struck the ice. The gremlin skittered forward, gazing wildly about, searching for intruders. Hey, ugly, called a familiar voice. Nice place you've got here. Here's a thought, though. Next time, try a hideout a little more resistant to fire than an ice cave. Puck, I cried, and the red-haired elf waved at me, grinning from the far side of the cavern. Iron Horse screamed and charged, scattering gremlins like birds as he bore down on Puck. Puck didn't move, and the great iron beast knocked him flat in the ice, trampling him with his steel hooves. Oh, that looked painful, called another Puck a little farther down. We really need to talk about your anger management issues. With a roar, Iron Horse charged the second Puck, moving farther away from me and the trod. The gremlins followed, laughing and hissing, but kept a fair distance from the raging beast and its hooves. A cool hand clamped over my mouth, muffling my startled shriek. I turned to gaze into glittering silver eyes. Ash? This way, he said in a low voice, tugging on my hand, while the idiot has them distracted. No, wait, I whispered, pulling back. He knows about Ethan. I have to find my brother. Ash narrowed his eyes. Hesitate now and Goodfellow will die. Besides, he reached out and took my hand again. I'm not giving you a choice. Dazed, I followed the Winter Prince along the wall of the cavern, too stunned to ask why he was helping me. Didn't he want to kill me? Was this rescue just to get me alone to finish the job in peace? But that didn't make any sense. He could have just killed me while Puck was distracted with Iron Horse. Hello, Puck's voice echoed farther down the cavern. Sorry, ugly. Wrong me. Keep going. I'm sure you'll get it right next time. Iron Horse looked up from stomping a fake Puck into the ground, crimson eyes blazing with hate. Seeing yet another Puck, it tensed iron muscles to charge when one of the gremlins spotted us sneaking along the wall and gave a yelp of alarm. Iron Horse whirled, eyes flaring as they settled on us. Ash muttered a curse. With a bellow and a blast of flame from its nostrils, it charged, bearing down on us like the steam engine it was named for. Ash drew his sword and flung a shower of ice shards at the monster. 
They shattered harmlessly on its armored hide, doing nothing but enraging it further. As the roaring, flaming bulk of metal descended, Ash shoved me out of the way and dove forward, the flailing hooves missing him by inches. Rolling to his feet behind the monster, he cut at its flank, but Iron Horse plunged its head down and kicked him in the ribs. There was a sickening crack, and Ash was hurled away, crumpling to the floor in a heap. A screaming flock of ravens descended on Iron Horse before it could stomp Ash into the ground. They swirled around its head, pecking and clawing, and Iron Horse roared as it lashed out at the flock, blasting them to cindery bits. Ash staggered to his feet as Puck appeared beside him, grabbing my hand. Time to go, he announced cheerfully. Prince, either keep up or get left behind. We're leaving. We ran through the caverns, slipping on ice and slush, the insane roars of Iron Horse and the hissing of the gremlins on our heels. I didn't dare look back. The cavern shook, and icicles smashed to the ground all around us, spraying me with stinging shards, but we kept going. A fuzzy gray shape bounded toward us, tail held high. You found her, Grimalkin said, stopping to glare at Puck. Idiot, I told you not to fight the horse thing. Can't talk now, little busy at the moment. Puck gasped as we tore past the feline, continuing down the tunnel. Grimalkin flattened his ears and joined us as the shrieks of the gremlins ricocheted off the walls. I could see the mouth of the cave, dripping with icicles, and put on a burst of speed. Iron Horse bellowed, and an ice shard smashed down inches from my face. Collapse the cave, Grimalkin shouted, bounding along beside us. Bring the ceiling down on their heads, do it! He zipped away, through the cave entrance, and was gone. We burst out of the cave moments later, gasping, stumbling in the snow. Looking back, I saw dozens of green eyes skittering forward, heard the pounding hooves of Iron Horse as he followed close behind. Keep going, Ash cried and whirled around. Closing his eyes, he brought a fist to his face and bowed his head. The gremlins swarmed toward him, and the red glow of Iron Horse appeared, flames streaming in the darkness. Ash opened his eyes and flung out a hand. A low rumble shook the ground, and the cave trembled. Huge clumps of icicles shivered, wobbling back and forth. As the gremlins reached the mouth of the cave, the entire ceiling collapsed with a roar and a sound like breaking glass. Gremlins shrieked as they were crushed under several tons of ice and rock, and the dismayed bellow of Iron Horse rose above the cacophony. The noise died away, and silence fell. Ash, standing two feet from the solid wall of ice sealing the cave, collapsed into the snow. Puck grabbed my arm as I rushed forward. Whoa, whoa, princess, he said as I tried yanking free. What do you think you're doing? In case you forgot, princeling there is the enemy. We don't help the enemy. He's hurt. All the more reason to leave now. He just saved our lives. Technically, he was saving his own life, Puck replied, still not letting go. I shoved him hard, and he finally released me. Look, princess. He sighed as I glared at him. Do you think Ash will play nice now? The only reason he helped, the only reason he agreed to a truce, was so he could bring you to Mab. She wants you alive. To use as leverage against Oberon. That's the only reason he came along. If he wasn't hurt, he'd be trying to kill me now. I looked at Ash, lying motionless in the snow. Flakes speckled his body. Soon they would hide him completely. We can't just leave him to die. He's a winter prince, Megan. He won't freeze to death, trust me. I scowled at him. You're just as bad as they are. He blinked, startled, and I turned away from him. I'm going to see if he's all right, at least. Either come along or get out of my way. Puck threw up his hands. Fine, princess. 
I'll help the son of Mab, eternal enemy of our court, even though he'll probably stick a sword in my back the second my guard is down. I wouldn't worry about that, Ash muttered, rising slowly to his feet. One hand gripped his sword, the other arm was wrapped around his ribs. He shook the snow from his hair and raised his weapon. We can continue now, if you like. Grinning, Puck pulled his dagger. I'd be thrilled, he muttered, taking a step forward. This won't take long at all. I threw myself between them. Stop it! I hissed, glaring at both in turn. Stop it right now! Put your weapons down, both of you! Ash, you're in no condition to fight. And Puck? Shame on you, agreeing to duel with him when he's obviously hurt. Sit down and shut up. They blinked at me, astounded, but slowly lowered their weapons. A sneezing laugh rang out in the branches of a tree, and Grimalkin peered down, swishing his tail in mirth. A daughter of Oberon after all, he called, baring his teeth in a feline grin. Queen Titania would be proud. Puck shrugged and flopped down on a log, crossing his arms and legs. Ash continued to stand, watching me with an unreadable expression. Ignoring Puck, I walked up to him. His eyes narrowed, and he tensed, raising his sword. But I wasn't afraid. For the first time since I came here, I wasn't afraid at all. Prince Ash, I murmured, drawing closer. I propose we make a deal. Surprise flickered across his face. We need your help, I continued, gazing straight into his eyes. I don't know what those things were, but they called themselves Iron Fae. They also mentioned someone called Machina, the Iron King. Do you know who that is? The Iron King? Ash shook his head. There is no one by that name in the courts. If this King Machina exists, he is a danger to all of us. Both courts will want to know about him and these iron fey. I need to find him, I said, forcing as much determination into my voice as I could. He's got my brother. I need you to help us escape the unseely territory and find the court of the Iron King. Ash raised an eyebrow. And why would I do that? He asked softly not mocking, but dead serious. I swallowed. You're injured, I pointed out, holding his gaze. You won't be able to take me by force, not with Puck so eager to stick a knife in your ribs. I glanced back at Puck, sulking on the log, and lowered my voice. Here's my bargain. If you help me find my brother and get him safely home, then I'll go with you to the unseely court, without a fight, from me or Puck. Ash's eyes gleamed. He means that much to you. You would exchange your freedom for his safety. I took a deep breath and nodded. Yes. The word hung in the air between us, and I hurried on before I could take it back. So do we have a deal? He inclined his head, as if still trying to puzzle me out. No, Megan Chase. We have a contract. Good. My legs trembled. I backed away from him, needing to sit before I fell over. And no trying to kill Puck, either. That wasn't part of the bargain, Ash said, before he grimaced and sank to his knees, arms around his middle. Dark blood trickled between his lips. Puck! I called, turning to glare at the fairy on the log. Get over here and help! Oh, we're playing nice now? Puck remained seated, looking anything but compliant. Shall we have tea first? Brew up a nice pot of kiss my ass? Puck! I shouted in exasperation, but Ash raised his head and stared at his enemy. Truce, good fellow, he grated out. The Chill Sorrow Manor is a few miles east of here. Right now, the lady of the house is away at court, so we will be safe there. 
I suggest we postpone our duel until we arrive and the princess is out of the cold. Unless you'd like to kill me now. No, no, we can kill each other later. Puck hopped off the stump and padded up, shoving his dagger into his boot. Putting the prince's arm over his shoulders, he jerked him to his feet. Ash grunted and pursed his lips but didn't cry out. I glared at Puck. He ignored me. Off we go, Puck sighed. You coming, Grimalkin? Oh, definitely. Grimalkin landed with a soft thump in the snow. His golden eyes, bright with amusement, regarded me knowingly. I would not miss this for the world. Chapter 17 The Oracle The Chill Sorrow Manor lived up to its name. The outside of the sprawling estate was blanketed in ice. The lawn was frozen. The numerous thorn trees were encased in crystallized water. Inside wasn't much better. The stairways were slick. The floors resembled ice rinks, and my breath hung in the air as we made our way through the frigid, narrow halls. At least the servants were helpful, if extremely creepy. Skeleton-thin gnomes with pure white skin and long, long fingers glided silently around the house, not saying a word. Their pupilless black eyes seemed too big for their faces, and they had the unnerving habit of staring at you mournfully as if you had a fatal disease and were not long for the world. Still, they welcomed us into the house, bowing respectfully to Ash, making him comfortable in one of the rooms. The biting chill didn't affect the Winter Prince, though I was shaking, teeth chattering, until one of the servants offered me a heavy quilt and padded off without a word. Clutching the quilt gratefully, I peeked into the room where Ash sat on a bed surrounded by icy gnomes. His shirt was off, showing his lean, muscular arms and chest. He was built more like a dancer or martial artist than a bodybuilder. The elegant frame hinting at a grace a human simply could not match. His tousled black hair fell into his eyes, and he absently raked it out of his face. My stomach fluttered weirdly as I backed out into the hall. What are you doing? I asked myself, appalled. That is Ash, Prince of the Unseelie Court. He tried to kill Puck, and he might try to kill you as well. He is not sexy. He's not. But he was. Extremely. And it was useless to deny it. My heart and my brain were at odds, and I knew I'd better come to terms with this quickly. Okay? Fine. I told myself. He's gorgeous, I'll admit it. I'm just reacting to his good looks, that's all. All the she are stunning and beautiful. It doesn't mean anything. With that thought to buoy me, I stepped back into the room. Ash glanced up as I approached, the quilt wrapped around my shoulders. A pair of gnomes were wrapping his torso in bandages. But above his stomach, I could see an angry black welt. Is that where... Ash nodded, once... I continued to stare at it, noting how the flesh was blackened and crusted with scabs. I shuddered and looked away. It looks almost burned. The creature's hooves were made of iron, Ash replied. Iron tends to burn when it doesn't kill outright. I was lucky the blow wasn't over my heart. The gnomes tugged the bandages tight, and he winced. How bad are you hurt? He gave me an appraising look. The fey heal faster than you mortals, he answered, and rose gracefully to his feet, scattering gnomes. Especially if we're within our own territories. Except for this, he lightly touched the iron burn on his ribs. I should be fine by tomorrow. Oh. I was a bit breathless, suddenly unable to take my eyes from him. That's... Good, then. He smiled then, a cold, humorless gesture, and stepped closer. Good? His voice was mocking. You shouldn't wish for my good health, princess. It would have been easier for you if Puck had killed me when he had the chance. 
I resisted the urge to back away from him. No, it wouldn't. His shadow loomed over me, prickling my skin, but I stood my ground. I need your help, both to get out of unseely territory and to find my brother. Besides, I couldn't let him kill you in cold blood. Why not? He was very close now, so close I could see the pale scars on his chest. He seems very devoted to you. Perhaps you'll wait until we leave Tir Nanog to have him stab me in the back. What would happen if we fought again, and I killed him? Stop it. I glared at him, meeting his eyes. Why are you doing this? I gave you my word. Why are you pulling this crap now? Just want to see where you stand, princess. Ash backed up a step, no longer smiling. I'd like to get a feel for my enemies before we engage in combat. See what their strengths and weaknesses are. We aren't in combat. Combat doesn't have to be with swords. Ash walked back to the bed, drawing his blade and examining the gleaming length. Emotions can be deadly weapons, and knowing your enemy's breaking point can be key to winning a battle. For example... He turned and pointed the sword, staring at me down the polished edge... You would do anything to find your brother. Put yourself in danger. Bargain with the enemy. Give up your own freedom, if it means saving him. You'd likely do the same for your friends, or anyone else you care about. Your personal loyalty is your breaking point, and your enemies will certainly use it against you. That is your weakness, princess. That is the most dangerous aspect in your life. So what? I challenged, pulling the quilt tighter around myself. All you're telling me is I won't betray my friends or family. If that's a weakness, it's one I want. He regarded me with glittering eyes, the expression on his face unreadable. And if the choice was between saving your brother and letting me die, which would you choose? The answer should be obvious, but could you do it? I chewed my lip and remained silent. Ash nodded slowly and turned away. I'm tired, he said, sitting down on the bed. You should find Puck and decide where we go from here. Unless, of course, you know where this Machina's court is. I do not. If I'm going to help you, I need rest. He lay back and put an arm over his eyes, dismissing me. I backed out of the room dark doubts swirling around my head. In the hallway, I met Puck, leaning against the wall with his arms crossed. So, how is the handsome princeling? He mocked, shoving away from the wall. Will he survive his ordeal to fight another day? He's fine, I muttered as Puck fell into step beside me. He's got a nasty-looking burn with a horse kicked him, and I think his ribs were broken, but he wouldn't say... Forgive me if my heart doesn't bleed for him, Puck replied, rolling his eyes. I don't know how you got him to help, Princess, but I wouldn't trust him further than I could throw him. Deals with the Winter Court are bad news. What did you promise him? Nothing, I said, not meeting his eyes. I could feel his disbelieving stare and went on the offensive to distract him. Look, what's your deal with him anyway? He said you stabbed him in the back once. What's up with that? That... Puck hesitated, and I could see I'd hit a sore spot. That was a mistake. He went on in a quiet voice. I didn't mean for that to happen. He shook himself, and the self-doubt dropped away, replaced by his irritating smirk. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm not the bad guy here, princess. No, I admitted. You're not but I'm going to need both of you to help get Ethan back, especially now, especially since this Iron King wants me so bad. Do you know anything about him? Puck sobered. I've never heard of him before, he murmured as we entered the dining hall. A long table stood in the center of the room with a magnificent ice sculpture as a centerpiece. 
Grimalkin crouched on the table with his head in a bowl, eating something that smelled strongly of fish. He glanced up as we entered, licking his jaws with a bright pink tongue. Heard of who before? King Machina. I pulled up a chair and sat down, resting my chin in my hands. That horse thing, Iron Horse, called him the ruler of the Iron Fae. Hmm, I've never heard of him. Grimalkin put his head back in the bowl, chewing loudly. Puck sat down beside me. It doesn't seem possible, he muttered, mirroring my pose with his chin in his hands. Iron Fae? It's blasphemous. It goes against everything we know. He touched his fingers to his brow, narrowing his eyes. And yet, Iron Horse was most definitely Fay. I could sense that. If there are more like him in those gremlin things, Oberon must be informed immediately. If this King Machina brings his Iron Fay against us, he could destroy the courts before we knew what hit us. But you know nothing about him. Grimalkin said, his voice echoing inside the bowl. You have no idea where he is, what his motives are, how many Iron Fae are actually out there. What would you tell Oberon now, especially since you have, him, fallen out of favor by disobeying him? He's right, I said. We should find out more about this Machina before we tell the courts. What if they decide to confront him now? He might fight back, or he might go into hiding. I can't risk losing Ethan. Megan, no telling the courts, I said firmly, looking at him in the eye. That's final. Puck sighed and threw me a grudging smirk. Fine, princess, he said, raising his hands. We'll do it your way. Grimalkin snickered into the bowl. So, how do we find this machina anyway? I asked, voicing the question that had bothered me all evening. The only trod to his kingdom that we know of is buried under a ton of ice. Where do we start looking for him? He could be anywhere. Grimalkin raised his head. I might know somebody who could help us. He purred, slitting his eyes. An oracle of sorts, living within your world. Very old. Older even than Puck. Older than Oberon almost as old as cats. If anyone could tell you where this Iron King might be, she could. My heart leaped. If this oracle could tell me about the Iron King, maybe she would know where my dad was as well. It couldn't hurt to ask. I thought she died, Puck said. If it's the same oracle I'm thinking of, she vanished ages ago. Grimalkin yawned and licked his whiskers. Not dead, he replied. Hardly dead. But she changed her name and appearance so many times, even the oldest Fay would hardly remember her. She likes to keep a low profile, you know? Puck frowned, knitting his brows together. Then how is it you remember her? He demanded, sounding indignant. I'm a cat, purred Grimalkin. I didn't sleep well that night. The numerous quilts didn't quite protect me from the incessant chill. It crept into whatever cracks it could find, stealing away the heat with frozen fingers. Also, Grimalkin slept on top of me under the blankets, his furry body a blessed warmth, but he kept digging his claws into my skin. Near dawn, after being poked awake yet again, I rose, wrapped a quilt around my shoulders, and went looking for Puck. Instead, I found Ash in the dining hall practicing sword drills by the gray light of dawn. His lean, honed body glided over the tiles, sword sweeping gracefully through the air, eyes closed in concentration. I stood in the doorway and watched for several minutes, unable to tear my gaze away. It was a dance, beautiful and hypnotic. I lost track of the time I stood watching him and would have happily stayed there all morning when he opened his eyes and saw me. I squeaked and straightened guiltily. Don't mind me, I said as he relaxed his stance. I didn't mean to interrupt. Please, continue. I'm finished anyway. Sheathing his sword, he regarded me solemnly. 
Did you need something? I realized I was staring and blushed, turning my gaze away. Um, no. That is, I'm glad you're feeling better. He gave me a weird little smile. I have to be on top of my game if I'm going to kill things for you, right? I was saved a reply as Puck strolled in, humming, carrying a bowl of strange golden fruit, each about the size of a golf ball. Morning, princess, he said with his mouth full, plunking the bowl on the table. Look what I found. Ash blinked. Are you raiding the cellars now, good fellow? Me? Stealing? Puck flashed a devious grin and popped another fruit into his mouth. In the house of my ancient enemy, what gave you that idea? He plucked another fruit and tossed it to me with a wink. It was warm and soft and had the texture of an overripe pear. Grimalkin leaped onto the table and sniffed. Summer pod, he stated, wrapping his tail around himself. I did not think they grew in the winter territories. He turned to me with a serious expression. Better not eat too many of those, he warned. They make fairy wine out of that. Your human side will not handle it well. I'll let her try one, Puck snorted, rolling his eyes. She's been in fairy long enough, eating our food. It won't turn her into a rat or anything. Where are we going? Ash questioned, sounding bored with us all. Did you manage to come up with a plan to find the Iron King, or are we going to paint targets on our backs and wander in circles until he notices? I bit into the fruit. The warmth flooded my mouth. I swallowed, and it filled my whole body, driving away the cold. The quilt was suffocatingly hot. I draped it over the chairs and gulped the rest of the fruit in one bite. You're awfully eager to help? Puck drawled, leaning back against the table. And here I was getting ready for a duel first thing in the morning. Why the change of heart, Prince? The effects of the summer pod were fading. Cold prickled my arms and my cheeks tingled, ignoring Grimalkin's warning glare. I snatched another fruit and popped it into my mouth, like Puck had done. Wonderful, delicious warmth surged into me, and I sighed in pleasure. Ash's outline blurred at the edges as he faced Puck. Your princess and I made a bargain, he said. I agreed to help her find the Iron King, though I won't bore you with the details. While I will uphold my end of the contract, it did not involve you in any way. I only promised to help her. Which means we're still free to duel each other any time we want. Exactly. The room swayed slightly. I plunked into a chair and grabbed another summer pod from the bowl, shoving the whole thing in my mouth. Again, I felt that wonderful rush of heat and headiness. Somewhere far away, Puck and Ash were holding a dangerous conversation. But I couldn't bring myself to care. Hooking the edge of the bowl, I pulled the whole thing to me and began popping them like candy. Well, why wait? Puck sounded eager. We could step outside right now, your highness, and get this over with. Grimalkin sighed loudly, interrupting the conversation. Both fairies turned and glared at him. This is all quite fascinating, Grimalkin said, his voice slurring in my ears. But instead of posing and scratching the ground like rutting peacocks, perhaps you should look to the girl. Both boys glanced at me, and Puck's eyes got huge. Princess! He yelped, springing over and tugging the bowl from my grasping fingers. You're not supposed to... not all of them! How many of those did you eat? How very like you, Puck. Ash's voice came from a great distance, and the room started to spin. Offer them a taste of fairy wine, and act surprised when they're consumed by it. That struck me as hilarious, and I broke into hysterical giggles. And once again, I couldn't stop. I laughed until I was gasping for breath, tears streaming down my face. My feet itched, and my skin crawled. I needed to move, to do something. 
I tried standing up, wanting to spin and dance, but the room tilted violently and I fell, still shrieking with laughter. Somebody caught me, scooping me off my feet and into their arms. I smelled frost in winter and heard an exasperated sigh from somewhere above my head. What are you doing, Ash? I heard someone ask. A familiar voice, though I couldn't think of his name, or why he sounded so suspicious. I'm taking her back to her room. The person above me sounded wonderfully calm and deep. I sighed and settled into his arms. She'll have to sleep off the effects of the fruit. We'll likely be here another day because of your idiocy. The other voice said something garbled and unintelligible. I was suddenly too sleepy and lightheaded to care. Relaxing against the mysterious person's chest, I fell into a heady sleep. I stood in a dark room, surrounded by machinery. Steel cables as thick as my arm dangled overhead. House-sized computers lined the walls, blinking with millions of flashing lights and thousands of broken televisions, ancient PCs, out-of-date game consoles, and VHS players lay in drifts and heaps throughout the room. Wires covered everything, writhing and slithering along the walls, over the mountains of forgotten technology, dropping in tangled clumps from the ceiling. A loud thrumming filled the area, making the floor vibrate and my teeth buzz. Maggie? The strangled whisper came from behind me. I turned to see a small shape dangling from the wires. They coiled around his arms, chest, and legs, holding him spread-eagled near the ceiling. With horror, I saw some of the wires stabbing into him, plugged into his face, neck, and forehead like electrical outlets. He dangled, weakly, blue eyes beseeching mine. Maggie? Ethan whispered as something huge and monstrous rose up behind him. Save me. I bolted upright, screaming, the image of Ethan dangling from the wires burned into my mind. Grimalkin leaped away with a yowl, sharp claws stabbing into my chest as he fled. I barely felt them. Flinging aside the bed covers, I raced for the door. A dark shape rose from a chair against the wall, intercepting me as I tried to bolt through. It caught my upper arms, holding me still as I struggled with it. All I could see was Ethan's face, contorted in agony, dying in front of me. Let go! I screamed, jerking my arm free and trying to claw my opponent's eyes. Ethan is out there! I have to save him! Let me go! You don't even know where he is. A hand caught my flailing wrist and pinned it to his chest. Silver eyes glared into mine as he shook me once. Listen to me. If you go charging out there without a plan, you'll kill us all and your brother will die. Is that what you want? I sagged against him. No, I whispered, all the fight going out of me. Tears welled, and I shook with the effort of holding them back, I couldn't be weak. Not anymore. If I was going to have any hope of saving my brother, I couldn't stand in a corner and cry. I had to be strong. With a shaky breath, I straightened and wiped my eyes. Sorry, I whispered, embarrassed. I'm okay now. No more freaking out, I promise. Ash still held my hand. Gently, I tried pulling back, but he wasn't letting go. I glanced up and found his face inches from mine, his eyes searingly bright in the shadows of the room. Time froze around us. My heart stumbled a bit, then picked up, louder and faster than before. Ash's expression was blank. Nothing showed on his face or in his eyes. But his body had gone very still. I knew I was blushing like a fire engine. His fingers came up and gently brushed a tear from my cheek, sending a tingle through my skin. I shivered, frightened by the pressure mounting between us, needing to break the tension. I licked my lips and whispered, Is this where you say you'll kill me? One corner of his lip curled. If you like, he murmured, 
a flicker of amusement finally crossing his face. Though it's gotten far too interesting for that. Footsteps sounded outside in the hall, and Ash moved away, dropping my hand. He crossed his arms and leaned against the wall as Puck entered, Grimalkin loping lazily behind him. I took a deep, furtive breath and hoped my burning face was lost in the shadows. Puck shot Ash a suspicious glare before looking at me. A sheepish grin crossed his lips. Er, how you feeling, princess? He asked, lacing both his hands behind his head, a sure sign that he was nervous. Those summer pod fruits pack quite a punch, don't they? Hey, at least it wasn't bristlewort. You would have spent the rest of the evening as a hedgehog. I sighed, knowing that was as close to an apology as I would get. I'm fine, I told him, rolling my eyes. When do we leave? Puck blinked, but Ash answered as if nothing had happened. Tonight, he said, coming away from the wall, stretching like a panther. We've wasted enough time here. I assume the cat she knows the way to this oracle? Grimalkin yawned, showing off fangs and a bright pink tongue. Obviously. How far is it? I asked him. The cat looked from me to Ash and purred knowingly. The oracle lives in the human world, he said, in a large city that sits below sea level. Every year, people dress in costume and throw an enormous fiasco. They dance and eat and toss beads at others for removing their clothing. New Orleans, I said, frowning. You're talking about New Orleans. I groaned, thinking about what it would take to get there. New Orleans was the closest city to our tiny little hick town, but it was still a long drive. I knew because I'd fantasized about driving to the near-mythical city when I finally got my license. That's hundreds of miles away, I protested. I have no car and no money for a plane ticket. How are we going to get there, or are we planning to hitchhike? Human. The never-never touches all borders of the human world. Grimalkin shook his head, sounding impatient. It has no physical boundaries. You can get to Bora Bora from here if you knew the right trod. Stop thinking in human terms. I am sure the prince knows a path to the city. Oh, sure he does, Puck broke in. Or a path right into the center of the unsealy court. Not that I'd mind crashing Mab's party, but I'd like for it to be on my own terms. He won't lead us into a trap, I snapped at Puck, who blinked at me. He promised to help us find the Iron King. He'd be breaking his word if he handed us over to Mab. Right, Ash? Ash looked uncomfortable, but nodded. Right, I repeated, forcing a bravado I didn't feel. I hoped Ash wouldn't betray us, but as I'd learned, deals with fairies tended to bite you in the ass. I shook off my hesitation and turned to the prince. So, I demanded, trying to sound confident, where can we find this trod to New Orleans? The frost giant ruins, Ash replied, looking thoughtful. Very close to Mab's court. At Puck's glare, he shrugged and offered a tiny, rueful smirk. She goes to Mardi Gras every year. I pictured the queen of the unsealy court flashing a couple of drunken partygoers and giggled uncontrollably. All three shot me a strange look. Sorry. I gasped, biting my lip. Still kind of giddy, I guess. Shall we go then? Puck grinned. Just let me borrow some supplies. Later, the four of us walked down a narrow, ice-slick trail, the chill sorrow manor growing smaller and smaller behind us. Some time during the night, the gnomes had disappeared. The house was empty when we left. As if it had been that way for a hundred years... I wore a long robe of gray fur that tinkled musically when I walked, like tiny wind chimes. Puck had given it to me when we were clear of the manor, under the disapproving glare of ash, and I didn't dare ask him where he got it. But it kept me perfectly warm and comfortable as we traveled through Mab's cold, frozen domain. As we walked, I began to realize that the icy landscape of the unsealy territory was just as beautiful, 
and dangerous, as Oberon's domain. Icicles dangled from the trees, sparkling like diamonds in the light. Occasionally, a skeleton lay beneath them, spears of ice between its bones. Crystal flowers bloomed along the road, petals as hard and delicate as glass, thorns angling toward me as I approached. Once I thought I saw a white bear watching us from atop a hill, a tiny figure perched on its back, but a tree passed in front of my vision and they were gone. Ash and Puck didn't say a word to each other as we traveled, which was probably a good thing. The last thing I wanted was another duel to the death. The prince kept a steady, silent march ahead of us, rarely looking back, while Puck entertained me with jokes and useless chatter. I think he was attempting to keep my spirits up, to make me forget about Machina and my brother, and I was grateful for the distraction. Grimalkin vanished periodically, bounding off into the trees, only to reappear minutes or hours later with no explanation of where he'd been. Later that afternoon, we reached a range of jagged, ice-covered peaks, and the trek turned sharply uphill. The path grew slick and treacherous, and I had to watch where I put my feet. Puck had fallen back on the trail. He kept casting suspicious looks over his shoulder, as if he feared an ambush from behind. I glanced back at him again, and in that moment, my feet hit a patch of ice and slid out from under me. I flailed, losing my balance on the narrow trail, trying desperately to stay upright and not go tumbling back down the mountain. Something grabbed my wrist, pulling me forward. I collapsed against a solid chest, my fingers digging into the fabric to keep myself upright. As the adrenaline surge faded and my heartbeat returned to normal, I glanced up and found Ash's face inches from mine, so close I could see my reflection in his silvery eyes. His nearness made my senses spin, and I couldn't look away. This close, his face was carefully guarded, but I felt the rapid thud of his heart beneath my palm. My own heartbeat picked up in response. He held me a moment longer, just long enough to make my stomach lurch wildly, then stepped away, leaving me breathless in the middle of the trail. I looked back and found Puck glaring at me. Embarrassed and feeling strangely guilty, I dusted off my clothes and straightened my hair with an indignant huff before following Ash up the mountain. Puck didn't speak to me after that. By late evening, it had begun to snow, big, soft flakes drifting lazily from the sky. They literally sang as they fell past my ears, tiny voices dancing on the wind. Ash stopped in the middle of the path, looking back at us, Flakes dusted his hair and clothes, swirling around him as if alive. The unseelie cord isn't far ahead, he said, ignoring the eddies that spun around him. We should break from the road. Mab has others besides me looking for you as well. As he finished, the snow whirled madly around us, shrieking and tearing at our clothes. My fur coat clanged as the blizzard pelted me with snow, burning my cheeks and blinding me. I couldn't breathe. My limbs were frozen stiff to my sides. As the whirlwind calmed, I found myself encased in ice from neck down, unable to move. Puck was similarly frozen, except his whole head was covered in crystal glass, his features frozen in shock. Ash was unharmed, staring at us blankly. Damn it, Ash! I yelled, struggling to free myself. I couldn't even wiggle a finger. I thought we had a deal! A deal? whispered another voice. The whirlwind of snow solidified, merging into a tall woman with long white hair and blue-tinged skin. A white gown draped her elegant body, and her black lips curled into a smile. A deal? she repeated, turning to Ash with a mock horrified look. Do you tell, Ash, darling... I believe you've been hiding things from us. Chapter 18 The Voodoo Museum Nerissa, Ash murmured. He sounded disinterested, bored even, though I saw his fingers twitch toward his sword. To what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? The snow fairy regarded me like a spider watching an insect in its web, 
before turning pupilless black eyes on Ash. Did I hear her right, darling? She purred, drifting over the ground toward the prince. Did you actually make a bargain with the half-breed? As I recall, our queen ordered us to bring the daughter of Oberon to her. Are you fraternizing with the enemy now? Don't be ridiculous. Ash's voice was flat as he leveled a sneer in my direction. I would never betray my queen. She wants Oberon's daughter. I will bring her Oberon's daughter. And I was in the middle of doing so until you showed up and interrupted my progress. Nerissa looked unconvinced. A pretty speech, she crooned, running a finger down Ash's cheek, leaving a trail of frost. But what of the girl's companion? I believe you swore to kill Robin Goodfellow, Ash Darling. And yet, you bring him into the heart of our territory. If the queen knew he was here, she would allow me to deal with him on my terms. Ash interrupted, narrowing his eyes. The anger on his face was real now. I've brought Puck along because I want to kill him slowly. Take my time with him. After I've delivered the half-breed, I'll have centuries to exact my revenge on Robin Goodfellow. And no one will deny me that pleasure when it comes. Nerissa floated back. Of course not, darling, she placated. But perhaps I should take the half-breed on to court from here. You know how impatient the queen can be, and it really isn't fitting for the prince to be the escort. She smiled and drifted toward me. I'll just take this burden off your hands. Ash's sword rasped free, stopping the fairy in her tracks. Take another step, and it will be your last. How dare you threaten me? Nerissa whirled back, snow flurrying around her. I offer help, and this is my reward. Your brother will hear of this. I'm sure he will. Ash smiled coldly and didn't lower his sword. And you can tell Rowan that if he wants to gain Mab's favor, he should capture the half-breed himself, not send you to steal her from me. While you're at it, you can inform Queen Mab that I will deliver Oberon's daughter to her. I give my word on that. Now, he continued, making a shooing motion with his blade, it's time for you to leave. Nerissa glared at him a moment longer, her hair billowing around her face. Then she smiled. Very well, darling. I shall enjoy watching Rowan tear you limb from limb. Until we meet again. She twirled in place, her body dissipating into snow and wind, and blew away into the trees. Ash sighed, shaking his head. We need to move fast, he muttered, striding over to me. Nerissa will tell Rowan where we are, and he'll come speeding over to claim you for himself. Hold still. He raised his sword hilt and brought it smashing down on the ice. The frozen shell cracked and began to chip in places. He sliced down again, and the cracks widened. D don't worry about me. I said through chattering teeth. Help Puck. He'll suffocate in there. My bargain isn't with Goodfellow, Ash muttered, not looking up from his task. I don't make a habit of aiding mortal enemies. Besides, he'll be fine. He survived far worse than being frozen solid. Unfortunately. I glared at him. Are you really helping us? I demanded as more bits of the ice shell began to crack. What you said to Nerissa. I told her nothing that wasn't true. Ash interrupted, staring back at me. I will not betray my queen. When this is over, I will deliver Oberon's half-blood daughter to her as I promised. He broke eye contact and placed his hand over the ice, where the cracking was the greatest. I'll just do it a little later than she expects. Close your eyes. I did, and felt the ice column vibrate. 
The thrumming grew louder and stronger until, with the sound of breaking glass, the ice shattered into a million pieces and I was free. I sagged to the ground, shaking uncontrollably. My robe was coated in ice. The chiming fur silenced. Ash knelt down to help me up, but I slapped his hand away. I'm not going anywhere, I growled, until you get Puck out. He sighed irritably, but rose and walked over to the second frozen mound, putting his hand on it. This time, the ice shattered violently, flying in all directions like crystal shrapnel. Several pieces lodged in a nearby tree trunk, glittering ice daggers sunk deep into the bark. I cringed at the vicious explosion. If he had done that to me, I would have been shredded. Puck staggered forward his face bloody, his clothing in tatters. He swayed on his feet, eyes glazed over, and started to fall. I shrieked his name and raced over as he collapsed into my arms and disappeared.